Chapter 31 Debugging The early morning light, or at least the small part of it that reached the pyramid, illuminated rows of terrified people who stood in front of their camp. They gripped the hilts of their weapons as hard as they gritted their teeth, knuckles and gums whitening. A horde of gigantic scorpions was reflected in their wide-open eyes, approaching, promising pain and death. But these people weren't weak, and they did not falter. The scorpions approached, and a rainbow of skills rose to meet them, jumping out of the warriors like a wave of cicadas lunging at crops. The scorpions shrieked. They clashed. In the first clash, shrill shrieks filled that part of the cave, echoing all over the walls and reaching all ends of this subterranean world. Blue blood spurted freely, and black-colored limbs flew in the air, filling the ground with scorpion parts. But the hardness of their shells was impressive, and the second wave of scorpions broke through the attacks like dolphins jumping out of the waves. Hold! shouted a commanding male voice. The scorpions lunged and fell atop the weapons of the warriors, pincer striking sword and tail meeting lance. Cries of pain rung in the massive cave, shrill shrieks and roars, all combining into a cacophony of grueling proportions. The scorpion king was the first to meet the warriors, crashing through their lines as it sent weapons flying and left a line of broken bodies in its wake. It possessed power at the master tier, which the peak class of Anatolia and the nomad tribes were unable to stop. The beast carved a bloody path through the warriors, opening the way for its subjects as it mindlessly rushed ever forward, its survival instincts clouded by berserk fury. Phantasmal, multicolored warriors suddenly got in its path, accompanied by bursts of flame, wind, and sand. They stopped it, but could not harm it, and a maelstrom of violence followed the Scorpion King's wake. The scorpions were berserk, but dozens as they were, they were still outnumbered. Lives were reaped like weeds but the Anatolians and nomads gathered themselves, reorganizing as they barked orders left and right. In the end, the scorpions were ambush predators, and with their original momentum spent, they quickly began to fall. Blood flowed in rivers, both blue and red, and for a moment, the tide seemed to turn. We're under attack! A rough voice cut through the sound of battle, and the camp's leaders paled. From across the tents, an army of forty people was dashing towards them, weapons and skills at the ready. The people from the Academy of Sands had brown cloaks billowing behind them as they ran, drawing attention to their steely, determined eyes. The independent warriors, or at least those willing to stay with the Academy, were right behind, already shooting arrows and projectiles in the massive melee. From above, Long smiled. It looked like Cat had done her job. Pivoting in place, a contingent of nomads abandoned the previous battle and rushed to meet the Academy. They had also left a guard at that side of the camp, and the nomad reinforcements barely managed to reach them before the academy arrived. More screams and roars soon followed, blood once again beginning to flood the rock below their feet. But the two groups of enemies did not reach an impasse. Right as they collided, a host of wind blades came from the nomads' rear, tearing through their ranks and claiming lives like leaves in autumn. At the same time, a massive red staff appeared in the front line of the academy, crashing heavily against the nomads and throwing them back in swaths. Three imposing, horse-riding purple ghosts appeared, and their immaterial bodies were covered in tattoos as their eyes shone. All three of them emitted auras harsh and tried, auras sitting just below the master tier. A halberd appeared in the hands of one, and two pairs of curved swords in the hands of the other two before they split up. The halberd-wielding ghost pulled on its reins and headed backward for the source of the wind blades and the sword-wielding ghosts headed for the staff-wielding warrior. But he only mocked them. Only two? He laughed unrestrainedly, standing in the middle of five incapacitated nomads. They all sported several broken bones, groaning but unable to join the battle. Monkadil, the star student of the Academy of Sands, held his staff in front of his body and assumed a battle stance. Under his thick facial hair, which covered most of his face, he grinned wildly. You still haven't learned your lesson. The ghost warriors lunged at him, each rotating two swords at crazy speeds. Their phantasmal horses neighed and fumed, throwing themselves at Monkadil's staff with wild abandon. And he responded in kind. The staff spun in his hands so quickly that it resembled a wheel. As soon as the ghosts reached him, he stepped fearlessly forward, his weapon lunging out in a series of impossibly fast strikes. 
It seemed to be everywhere, blocking and deflecting all four swords of the ghosts while also striking back at them. The two ends of the staff moved in harmony, each being a weapon of its own, and their shining red trajectories combined in a dance of strength and overbearingness, completely overpowering the nomad ghosts. By the side, two nomads with glowing purple tattoos watched in shock. These were the spirits of their ancestors, steeped in battle for their entire lives and afterlives, and they were getting manhandled by a single young man. Monkadil's staff moved in a wide arc, sweeping both ghosts off their horses and onto the ground. The horses broke down, leaving only dissipating purple smoke behind, but Monkadil wasn't done. With a rotation over his head, the staff enlarged, becoming wide like a log, and he still wielded it easily as if it weighed nothing. The two ghosts braced themselves, picking up their fallen swords and charging at Monkadil. His staff swept by imperiously, not even slowed by their defenses. It broke right through them, cutting their ghostly bodies in half and throwing thick puffs of smoke to the side. The ghosts halted before dissipating into nothingness, and the two nomad summoners fell to the ground, clutching their hearts as they screamed in pain. This is what you get for underestimating me again, spoke Monkadil as his staff returned to normal. He swung again, crushing the heads of the two summoners like ripe watermelons. Then he sighed eyes momentarily softening as he muttered, And this is what you get for not leaving us alone. At the same time, the halberd-wielding ghost lashed out at Long, aiming to bisect him where he stood. In return, the cultivator unsheathed his sword and jumped at the ghost, rotating in midair to avoid the attack. Ten meters behind him, Mastic lay on multiple sets of small hands, panting heavily. His mana reserves were completely exhausted. Phil stood above him, guarding the bard as five stone golems carried him to safety. This was the plan. Mastic lures the scorpions, Long helps him and then fights, Phil protects Mastic when he's exhausted, and Cat convinces the academy to attack. Meanwhile, Long's body was crazily fluttering around the ghosts. The wind laws made his body as light as a feather, while short bursts of ki, highly condensed due to his pinhead cores, allowed him to maneuver in midair. He danced around the ghost like a fly and the nomad ancestor swung at the air again and again, completely unable to catch Long. But even if he flew like a feather, he stung like a bee. A kick planted itself in the ghost's face, throwing a pair of jagged teeth out. A blade pierced the ghost's ribs through its armor gaps, quickly retreating. While the ghost's form seemed phantasmal, it was fully corporeal. Long's sword methodically dissected his opponent, invading the gaps of its armor again and again, drawing purple blood that dissipated like smoke. A few moments later, the ghost finally reached its limits, disappearing in a final puff of smoke. Long landed gracefully on his feet, turning to regard a screaming nomad. He'd known this was only a summoning technique, but some warm-up never hurt. With his middle divine ellipse battle prowess, or at least somewhere close, this ghost could never touch the hem of his robes. The only reason he took so long was that he didn't want to force his sword against the ghost's armor. It already sported several chinks from battling the scorpions earlier. By now, the rest of the nomads on this side of the battlefield had fallen as well, and the academy's people streamed inside the enemy camp, stomping over tents and bonfires alike. Only Monkadil seemed to be missing, his hairy form nowhere to be seen. On the other side, the battle against the scorpions was still ongoing, seemingly proceeding well. If nothing went wrong, they would soon subdue the beasts, even the Scorpion King. It was surrounded by five peak class, and even its berserk fury could only support it for so long. Unfortunately for the Anatolians and the remaining nomads, the Academy wasn't going to simply let them be. They fell on the battle like a storm, lashing out at scorpions and enemies alike. They could have let the scorpions and Anatolians kill each other, but it wouldn't happen. Save for their king, the beasts were already dying or exhausted and they no longer posed a threat. As a matter of fact, with two-thirds of their numbers gone, neither did the combined forces of Anatolia and the nomads. The academy's people swarmed them quickly, killing those who resisted and capturing those smart enough to surrender. The scorpions were also disposed of, including the scorpion king, though nobody saw who landed the last blow. They only saw a dagger made of shadows penetrate the beast's throat, and then it was dead. The battle was over and now would come the lengthy process of tidying up, but Long was not interested in that. Things had gone perfectly according to plan, 
and he still had most of his strength, which led to a certain idea forming in his mind. His head swiveled, eyes falling on the Sphinx. If most or all of the Scorpions have left, including their king, then perhaps... Phil! he called out. I'm heading out. You watch out and find Cat. Be careful, responded the Artificer, a small army of golems having already formed around him. After his level-ups, he could control up to eighteen golems, not to mention his brand new automaton. Nodding, Long turned towards the statue and dashed off. It wouldn't take long before people realized where the scorpions had come from, and then the sphinx would become crowded, but by then it would be empty. Long snickered, accelerating. However, just as he approached the statue, a colossal boom rang out, and its stone nose fell off, smashing against the ground and breaking into thousands of small pieces. Long froze for a moment, staring at the Sphinx wide-eyed. While the missing nose was an interesting aesthetical choice, it was also taller than he was. Who or what had cut it off? But truthfully, Long could not back down. With the cultivation problem he faced and the despair it caused him, he was in dire need of cultivation treasures. Who knew what effects that urn hidden inside the Sphinx might have? He took a few measured steps, and just as he reached under the statue, a figure flew out of its nose and landed right in front of Long, raising a cloud of dust. As soon as the dust settled, a very hairy young man could be seen, holding a red staff in one hand and an urn filled to the brim with spiritual energies in the other. Oh? He raised a brow, smiling. My bad. I cut the nose off to look inside, but I didn't think there would be a person below. Long's eyes narrowed. This was the monkey man he'd noticed early on, the one with the insanely dense aura. He was only at the equivalent of the middle twin core realm, just like Long was, and yet something about this man gave the cultivator pause. Standing in front of him felt like staring at a dragon's open maw, ready to swallow him up and spit out his bones. It felt dangerous. Excuse me, brother, Long spoke softly yet decisively, but I went to all the trouble of emptying the Sphinx just to get this urn. Could you give it to me? I will make sure to compensate you later. The monkey man, Monkadil, raised a brow before looking at the urn. This thing? he asked, throwing it in the air and then catching it again. Apologies, friend. I have also taken a fancy to it, so I'm keeping it. Finders keepers. Long's brows fell. We helped you take care of your enemies and opened the way to the pyramid, he intoned in his words, allowing the better portion of his aura to gradually seep out. So I believe we deserve some compensation. You did neither of those things for us, my little friend. Monkadil's eyes also began to get intense, and he seemed completely indifferent to Long's aura. You did them for yourself, and we just happened to be there. You have my thanks, but I owe you nothing. This urn is mine. Owe me? It's not a matter of owing me, junior brother, Long grinned, showing his pearly white teeth. His robes began to flutter slightly, as did his long hair. It is a matter of stealing what is mine. We went to all this trouble for this item while you just happened to be there. If that is not theft, then what is it? Luck. Monkadil began spinning his staff in one hand, faster and faster, raising a soft wind around it. Long couldn't help but feel a thirst for battle coursing through his body. Using wind to intimidate him, of all people? What an interesting way to commit suicide. Luck is nothing without strength, he laughed, and the wind picked up in a vortex around him, his aura trying to envelop the arrogant man who called himself Monkadil. Fight me for it, junior brother, if you dare. Dare? Why wouldn't I dare? The monkey man also laughed, a similarly towering aura rising from his body and keeping Longs at bay. It felt rough and strong, unsurpassable, like a steep cliff, unstoppable, like a landslide. But don't blame me if you die. In this generation, there is none who can surpass I, Monkadil. What arrogance, Long laughed, filled with the strangest combination of joy and battle lust. This man's arrogance intrigued him to no end, and all thoughts of bottlenecks and cultivation deviation left his mind, replaced by a weird sense of kinship. He just wished to measure his skills against the monkey man, right here, right now.
There comes a time when every little monkey boy learns his place in the world. For you, that time is now, because in this generation, only I am peerless. Ha ha ha, you damn bastard! The monkey man laughed in fury and joy, and Long could feel his emotions mirrored in his opponent. He couldn't contain his excitement. Monkadale let the urn fall, and it clattered hollowly on the ground. The next moment, his staff was in front of Long, heading for his face. The cultivator tilted his head, only barely dodging the strike, but the backside of Monkadil's staff struck again, and this time, Long couldn't dodge. It connected solidly against his chest, throwing him ten meters back and on the ground. Long coughed. He's strong. What, is that all you have? asked Monkadil, his staff still extended. Cheeky bastard! Long clutched his ribs. They hurt a bit, but he had managed to rotate his body and dissipate most of the attack's momentum. He grinned. At the same time, sixteen wind blades formed around him, rotating in a vortex of death. Monkadil frowned. Long laughed with excitement, pointing his sword at the monkey man. This is it. This is why I became a cultivator. Come! Chapter 32 Long vs. Monkadil Long flashed Monkadil a toothy grin before he charged. Swords flew and staffs fell. Blades made of wind cut the air itself while the earth churned in protest. Under the statue of the Sphinx, which was now discreetly missing its nose, Long and Monkadil battled fiercely, a fact that both were extremely surprised at. Both were geniuses, and both were completely unequaled at their level yet now they had met a match. On the ground between them, where both were careful not to attack, lay an urn that exuded energies as thick as blood. A small patch of sand slowly swirled around it in a vortex, showcasing the mystical strength of this fight's prize. Whatever the monkey man's reasons were for wanting it, Long could certainly put it to good use, perhaps even advance an entire small realm or redirect the rotation of his cores. It had to be his. Monkadil's staff rotated at speeds almost invisible to the naked eye. He stood still and formed a tornado of red around him, crushing the wind blades, one after another. Long lunged at him, peppering him with strikes, and the monkey man defended. Blade met staff, staff swung for head and missed, and Long kicked and was deflected, using the rotation to turn the attack into a slash that was parried. Monkadil was under pressure, and whenever he found an opening to strike back, a wind blade would appear and attack him, forcing him to step back. And yet, he held his ground. Due to the intensity of the battle, a low dust ring was rising around them. Both weapons were impossibly fast. Both were impossibly precise. They collided many times each second, causing sparks to fly and metal clangs to fill the air. In truth, Monkadil was slower, but his weapon's longer reach more than made up for it. Each of his strikes met many of Long's, which was only possible due to his flawless mastery of the staff. On the other hand, Long was attacking fiercely, searching for gaps in the monkey man's defense and using the wind blades to keep him busy. He struck and fainted with all his mastery in martial arts, applying every trick he knew to confuse his opponent. Monkadil fell for none, and he even responded in kind. He twisted, jumped, and whirled, his staff lashing out like an aggressive tree vine, fighting in a style as unpredictable as it was effective. Before now, the only system warriors that Long had fought were those at the bar where he first met Phil. They were laughably weak, and so he had assumed that this world did not really practice martial arts. How foolish, how stupid, he berated himself even as he fought. This man is no worse than I am. They kept exchanging strikes, and by now, people were already beginning to stream to the Sphinx. The sounds, including the fall of the broken nose, had attracted attention. And as they gathered, they all mutely watched this battle that they couldn't even follow. One fighter jumped, rotated, and moved unpredictably, while the other followed and retaliated at the apex of speed. Stay back! yelled Long and Monkadil at the same time, and the onlookers were more than happy to oblige. To them, the movements of the two fighters seemed choreographed as if they both acted and reacted at the same time. In truth, this was not a trick caused by high reaction speed, but rather by their mastery of martial arts. 
the two fighters each saw many strikes ahead, flowing from one movement to the next without a moment's delay, their movements as natural as water flowing down the creek. When masters fight, the onlookers only see them dancing. What the— A student of the academy gaped at the battle. For them, Monkadil was an absolute genius, a peerless prodigy, but his opponents seemed to be around Monkadil's age. Who is that guy? Oh, that? Phil stuck his chest out. That's short as fingerous. In the heated battle, a strike of Monkadil finally pushed Long back, regaining the momentum. You bastard! roared the monkey man, grinning widely. Block this! His staff immediately elongated until it was thrice its regular length, highly increasing the speed at which Monkadil could move its tip. When swung, it whistled and howled through the air, heading straight for Long. The air behind the cultivator shone blue. As with a similar howling sound, the surrounding wind was dragged towards him, as if sucked by a vortex. Why wouldn't I dare? he roared back. Gift of Aeolus! He pushed forth a palm, shouting, and the wind obeyed. Like a hound, it howled and rushed ahead, passing by him to smash against the tip of Monkadil's descending staff. The clash was deafening, the wind spreading out as strong gusts threatened to blow people away. But still, the staff held, and while slower, it did not come to a halt at all. Purple veins popped up on Monkadil's arms as he broke through Long's wind, forcing the cultivator to jump aside in order to avoid the attack. What's wrong? he roared, pulling his staff back. I thought you dared. Longer range hampers defense. Long's eyes narrowed as he once again unleashed sixteen blades of wind. They flew in an arc, surrounding the staff wielder before attacking him from all sides. But Monkadil refused to budge. Instantly reverting his staff size to normal, he swung it crazily, perfectly gauging each windblade's trajectory and breaking them apart. However, before even half of them could arrive, Long appeared behind the monkey man, stepping through his storm of attacks like a ghost or devil. Aware of the windblade trajectories himself, he dodged the mad swings and stepped inside Monkadil's guard, his sword snaking towards the warrior's body. Reacting instantaneously, the monkey man allowed two of the wind blades to bite into his left arm before bringing his staff smashing overhead against Long. The cultivator was forced to defend. If they exchanged strikes, he would most definitely die. The staff smashed down at Long's head, and he blocked it with his curved sword, resorting to a direct block for the first time in this battle. His feet dug into the stone below, and his arms trembled with exertion, while his sword bent and seemed ready to snap. Ha! he roared and the wind burst out in a circle, pushing Monkadil back and saving Long. A wide cloud of sand and dust rose from the rocky ground, enveloping their battlefield and giving both fighters a short respite. But between the wind blades, the gift of Aeolus, and the most recent wild burst of wind, Long's key reserves were quickly running dry. After all, he could only draw so much energy from his cores before they collapsed. And worst of all, his sword now sported a large crack. It had accompanied him for a long time, but after his most recent breakthroughs, it was quickly reaching the limits of its endurance. It wouldn't last another fight. On the other hand, the Monkey Man's staff was one of his strong points, and it was still in pristine condition, despite blocking so many wind blades head on. But the dust settled, and as Long lay there panting, so did Monkadil. Around his left arm, his brown cloak had been torn, revealing an exceedingly hairy upper arm and the blood that flowed from it. That arm wasn't out of commission yet, but the monkey man took care to hold his staff in just his right hand instead of both. You're running out of mana, noted Monkadil. And you're running out of arms. Heh, <laughs> the monkey man chuckled. How about we settle this then? What a coincidence, I was thinking the same thing. As the crowd began to whisper and make some distance, Monkadil placed his staff between his back and elbows. It instantly enlarged to the width of a log and twice its regular length, but it continued to lengthen. Threefold, fivefold, it grew all the way until it occupied half the distance between the two. What a mysterious weapon. Long narrowed his eyes, but at the same time, he was worried. This wouldn't be a simple staff strike. Yes, its power grew along with its length and girth, but there was something else at play here, something far more dangerous. He couldn't pinpoint it, but it didn't matter too much either. Crouching, Long brought his sword flat against his face. 
It began to glow blue, faintly at first, and then brighter as its entire length began to hum with power. Slowly, he raised the glowing blue sword high above his head, holding it with both hands as he aimed at the sky. Fujin's Canyon, he whispered, more to encourage himself than anything else. In truth, he was nervous. He could barely use this martial skill now that he'd broken through, but his sword probably couldn't handle it. But backing down now? He just couldn't do it. Seeing Long ready to strike, the monkey man also rotated his body and prepared to strike. Ruiji, hmm? Monkadil's eyes suddenly widened. Wait, he called out. Wait! Surprised, Long stilled himself, still holding his sword high. What is it? The urn, cried out Monkadil. The urn of broken sand! Where did it go? What? Long's eyes narrowed as they scanned the ground. Indeed, where the urn used to stand, there was now only rock. Somehow, they'd lost the item they were ready to bet their lives for. Ah! Monkadil smashed the butt of his staff against the ground, raising another cloud of sand and dust as he threw a tantrum. My urn! My urn! he cried out. Who took my urn? A monkey man! Long directed a glance at his opponent, still keeping his sword unsheathed. If the urn was gone, there was no reason to fight anymore, but being careful never hurt. You called it the urn of broken sand. Do you know what it is? Who's a monkey man? yelled Monkadil. You're a monkey man. Your mother is a monkey man. You have more hair than an ox, the cultivator raised a brow. And when you fight, you move like a monkey. If not a monkey man, then what are you? I am a monkey fighter, you, you blue person, Monkadil stomped the ground in anger. A monkey fighter, you hear me? That's my class. I'm not a monkey. Sure thing, Long nodded. So what's with the urn? Like hell, I tell you. Go find out for yourself, or do you want to fight me for it? Long's face soured. Monkadil. A tall, lean person stood out from the crowd, donning the attire of the academy. He approached the monkey man, whispering something in his ear. Humph, Monkadil snorted, placing his staff on the straps hanging from his back. He crossed his arms. All of a sudden, an imperious tone could be felt in his voice. The Academy of Sands does not need the help of outsiders to solve its problems. But, sir... No. They can enter the pyramid, but they cannot join us. However... He turned to Long, and his anger seemed to have waned by now. That urn is something my Academy dearly needs. The thief will not escape our grasp, but if you happen to find them first, we are willing to pay more than the urn is worth to acquire it. He turned to the small crowd of independent warriors who had come to observe the battle, bloodied and tired as they were, each dressed in different attires. That goes for all of you. If you find the thief, let us know, and you will not regret it. Even if you are the thief, the Academy is willing to spare your wretched life if you surrender. If you force us to find you, and I can assure you that we will, there will be no mercy. Wow, you are one fierce monkey, Long smirked. If I do find the urn, I will consider it. Oh, and if you keep calling me a monkey? Monkadil pointed his staff at Long, eyes hard. You will not walk again. The cultivator raised a brow, a mysteriously playful smile on his face. Fair enough. I will just call you by name then. Monkadil, was it? Eyes narrowing in suspicion, the monkey fighter nodded. And you are? Shortus, Long smiled widely. Shortus fingerus. That's stupid. Whatever you say, monk. Monkadil shot him a burning look, then sighed. <sighs> Us stupid name holders should help each other. Whatever. He turned to his henchmen. Let's head back to the nomad camp. There is a pyramid waiting. With the sun rising behind his back, a large gray-haired man crouched at the lip of the ruined town's entrance. He gazed at it from a hundred meters above, eyes wandering its houses. But in the end, his field of sight was limited from here. Without further ado, Brahm jumped into the hole. His vision scoured the ruins as he fell, landing on the dark pyramid in the distance. He narrowed his eyes. Longfang. 
Brom landed on his feet with a bang, raising a cloud of dust. Then, cracking his neck once, he dashed off at terrific speeds, heading straight for the pyramid, straight for Long's head. And as he ran, his eyes shone with violence. Chapter 33 A Heart of Gold Long walked abreast with Phil as they returned to the camp. The light slowly increased as they advanced, soft sand crunching underfoot, revealing a scenery similar yet different to yesterday's. How do you feel, Phil? asked Long lightly, shooting his friend a glance. The artificer walked with his gaze lowered, lost in thought and doubts. The four-armed ogres were one thing, because they were beasts. But killing all these people just because they were enemies? Like shit. Phil didn't doubt the reasoning behind it. These people had willingly come to a dangerous expedition and tried to sabotage others. Even if they were simply following orders, everyone was responsible for their own actions, and killing your enemies in a place like this was not wrong. Even if some of them were good people, good and bad had nothing to do with being enemies. No, Phil could see the point of that. But even if he could logically accept it, his heart spoke otherwise. Slaughtering others without caring about whether they as people deserved it or not couldn't be right, could it? Even Dankin and Loretta, who had healed Phil's knee, were among the dead. These two people struck a greater impression than all others put together, for the simple reason that they were not strangers. Phil knew them to be breathing, thinking people, even pleasant ones. And now they were dead. Why? I understand how you feel, brother. Long took a deep breath his gait slow and steady. I have been in your shoes. Why must we attack others? Why do good people have to die? But you see, that is simply the way things work. These people have already made the choice to come and fight, not on the basis of goodness, but on the basis of profit. Good and evil are important, but would you allow others to take advantage of you just because some of them might not deserve to die? I wouldn't, do we have to kill them? Phil looked up, his golden bangs shaking. Can it be solved differently? No. Long smiled sadly. Actions have consequences, and you always have to take them into account. Unless you're strong enough to ignore them, of course. If so, then you could make your own rules, and everyone would be forced to obey. Remember this, Phil. In this world and any other, strength is the only true rule. Phil shook his head thoughtfully, but didn't reply. They approached the destroyed camp unhindered, people making way to let them pass. Long's fight against Muckadil had reached many eyes and ears, and his strength garnered everyone's respect. Which is only natural. Am I or am I not a young master? Long mused to himself, enjoying the feeling. But still, that guy... His mind went back to the battle one where he could fight in earnest and fail to win. In the Blue Wind sect, and even in any nearby sects, there had been nobody his age who could face him as an equal. And now I was equaled by a random monkey. How nice. But as much as Long yearned for a good fight, Monkadil's strength had struck a hint of hesitation inside him. Had the battle gone on, Long might have lost. If not by weakness, then by lack of a weapon but one's weapons are also part of one's strength, he thought softly, thinking back to the crack that now covered his curved sword. His thoughts were cut short as they entered the area of the former camp. Corpses lay strewn on the hard ground, blood pooled under them. There were humans and scorpions alike, but they didn't seem so different now. When you're dead, a tail up or down hardly makes a difference. And what wrong had they done to deserve this? Long shook his head. Phil's words resurfacing in his mind. Perhaps articulating it wasn't easy, but this was definitely the rule of strength, the rule of the jungle. This was how things had been since time immemorial, and this was how they would forever be. When your life is in danger, mercy is simply a weakness, an invitation to death. Phil's doubts couldn't be well-grounded, right? Stepping over the numerous dead bodies that nobody was bothering to collect, they reached the space where the captives were held. They were few, barely a dozen, 
most Anatolian, with only two nomads, and their bodies dripped with blood and fear. Monkadil was already there, having rushed ahead with his followers. He didn't turn to regard them. Even if they weren't enemies, he had made it clear that they weren't friends either. The monkey man was currently bent over an Anatolian captive, a red-bearded man who seemed to be missing a few teeth. Even as Long and Phil approached, Monkadil shook his head and straightened his body. They know nothing, he spoke to his tall, lean follower, a man with a leaf-embroidered cap. We'll have to find the way ourselves. The way to what? Long's voice cut in from the side, and Monkadil threw him an annoyed look. None of your business, he replied, regarding Long with that weirdly energetic look of his, the one he constantly seemed to have. When will your people be ready? We have recovered the key, but if you're going to delay, we won't wait for you. My people? He raised a brow. Like the four of us? All of the independents. Everybody needs a leader, and they have seen your strength. If they have to follow someone, it can only be you. Huh. Long turned to regard the group of people who had chosen to brave this place, despite not having any backing. Several gazes were pinned on him, full of wonder, awe, and thinly veiled jealousy, but they were all pulled away as soon as he looked. The pyramid is a dangerous place, added Monkadil, turning to regard the gigantic monument. It is not a place for mere classed warriors. We are willing to risk our lives for what's hiding inside, but if you guys want to do the same, I suggest you stick with each other. Then you might have at least some hope of surviving. You know a lot about this pyramid, Phil intervened. I thought it was only recently discovered. The monkey man turned to regard the artificer blankly, and after a moment, he replied. The pyramid's location was only recently discovered, yes, but its existence was long known, though only to us. Or so we thought. A smile that was not a smile appeared on his face. The nomads must have been searching for this place for a long time. They even brought the key to the pyramid. That's why I was interrogating them, but the damn brutes haven't opened their mouths once. Compared to the half-truths and rumors we are aware of, they must know far more about this place. The urn of broken sand is only the tip of the sand dune. The wealth and power hiding inside must be... immeasurable. Monkadale shook his head, breaking out of his musings. In any case, I wish you luck. You'll definitely need it. Once we split up inside, we'll be enemies. Then you should hope you don't run into us or you'll be blown away, Long smirked. Now, I don't think we need to rest much. We can go in at the same time, in about an hour. Sounds good, Monkadil nodded, but someone had a different opinion. Um... Phil spoke up again, hesitantly, cowering under Monkadil's aura. The monkey man was approachable to Long, whose strength he had acknowledged, but to the artificer, he was cold. Still, Phil braced himself and spoke his mind. I think... maybe we should use this time to give these people a funeral. He gestured behind them, where tens of corpses littered the ground, left to rot in sand and dust. Before, each was their own person, filled with dreams, hopes, fears, and flaws. Now, they were merely organic matter waiting to be decomposed. A funeral? Long raised a brow. For the enemies? I think... some of them might have been good people. Perhaps killing them was right, as you said, but they still deserve a funeral he spoke passionately, then cowered again under Monkadil's intense glare. At least, that's what I believe. You are too kind, Phil. Long shook his head. Our energy would be better spent resting or searching the place. But I still think it's the right thing to do. The artificer allowed a hint of stubbornness in his voice. I went along with your plan to kill them. Please spare some effort to help me bury them. Long considered it. Okay, he finally relented. Why not? You are a weird little guy. Monkadil cupped his chin, a curious, energetic gaze locked on Phil. You aren't a warrior, are you? I'm a scholar. Phil shook his head. And I'm definitely not a little guy. Sure. He smiled widely, showing a monkey-like grin. We have already buried our people, but this sounds interesting. We'll help.
After some brief organizing and long establishing his leadership over the independence, he had them go along with the burial. A sand-filled hole nearby made it easy, so the whole thing didn't take more than half an hour. As it didn't take too long, they even buried the scorpions, on Phil's insistence that the beasts were just innocent animals that they'd led to death for their own benefit. An outrageous concept, as most people would rather be resting instead of burying monsters. But strangely, it made a bit of sense. Once one stopped thinking of the scorpions as mindless monsters and started considering them as simply animals, led by their natural instincts and living life in the only way they could, things changed. From that viewpoint, the expedition had invaded the scorpions' home and wantonly used them, even killed them for benefit and treasures. It was an odd line of thinking, but it wasn't necessarily wrong, and Long's mind raced back to the many monsters he'd killed in mystic realms, the many spiritual animals he'd hunted down to get stronger. So far, he'd considered them competitors in the struggle for power, justifying the need to kill them. The strong get stronger while the weak die, and every monster he'd killed had the strength to protect itself, was in the same competition that he was. But when Phil's words forced Long to rethink his position on the matter, it wasn't fully solid. The monsters were competitors, yes, but so were humans. Would he hunt humans down and invade their homes just to get stronger using the same reasoning? Or was it because, in his mind, monsters were only made to be killed, and all other reasons were merely excuses to rationalize it? Of course, a line had to be drawn somewhere, because too much peacefulness only led to weakness, which, in turn, led to death for one and one's people. But when one had to consciously place this line down somewhere, then things were not so simple. Perhaps thinking about it wouldn't change the position of the line, but the reasoning behind its placement would deepen by much. Perhaps too much. Maybe this was why nobody considered it. It made no difference except that it busied one's mind. For most people, perhaps mindlessly killing monsters was better. Or perhaps it wasn't. Who could tell? But Long believed that for one who stands at the top, these considerations are necessary. That is why he spared Phil's words some consideration instead of outright dismissing them as his instinct told him to. In the end, perhaps some questions were only meant for those who could handle their weight. The burial ceremony was a simple process. They buried all the bodies in the sand hole, after which Monkadil stepped forth and spoke a short prayer for all of them. Long listened in wonder. The monkey man spoke about gods he had never heard before. Groomsh, the god of warriors. Petra, the goddess of death, Amon, the god of fire and sand, and Zoram, the god of animals. And after the ceremony was over, and everyone's minds were weighed down by the burden of death, they slowly left and headed for the pyramid's entrance. In fact, it wasn't only their mind. Their steps were slower, their gaze focused downward. Perhaps burial should be saved for after everything is over, mused Long in hindsight, watching how many people seemed sapped of their strength. In fact, several people chose to back down and not enter the pyramid as they originally intended. Expectedly, neither Mastic nor Cat were among those who backed down. Of the thirty remaining independent warriors, only fifteen would follow Long's team inside the pyramid, and of the twenty people of the academy, another fifteen would follow Monkadil. He did not force anyone, but the monkey man's stance towards those who chose to stay behind was clear. He considered them weak and cowards, and did not spare them a second glance. The prisoners were also left behind, tied up, and some of the Academy's people offered to take care of them. With a final look at the world they left behind, the thirty people who would brave the pyramid gathered in front of its entrance, marveling at the large stone construction. Chapter 34 The Legend of a Pharaoh the pyramid's entrance was a large double stone gate embedded in the walls. It reached at least ten meters in the air and five across, inciting a feeling of awe to those who stood beneath it. Two giant cat statues stood at its sides as eternal guardians, each with one paw raised towards the outside. Whatever trials awaited inside, these two cats were probably the most peaceful guardians they would encounter. In the center of the entrance, where the double gates connected, was a small rectangular imprint. Slowly, Monkadale walked up to it, placing a stone tablet in the imprint. It fit exactly, and as soon as it clicked into place, 
The runes that covered its surface lit up, and the entire gate began to hum. The double gates parted slowly, imposingly, revealing a widening gap between them as they both retreated inwardly. The stone tablet, its engravings still shining blue, remained floating in place, not following the doors that opened behind it. Phil almost salivated at the thought of investigating the gate's mechanism and the tablet that served as a key. Behind the double gates, a dark corridor was revealed, heading inwards, and the smell of stale dry air assaulted them as if they were breathing air that hadn't moved for millennia. Long's heart skipped a beat. He could feel it again, calling to him. Even from here, his spiritual perception rejoiced at the treasure that lay hidden in the pyramid's bowels. Whatever this item was, it far eclipsed anything he'd ever seen, even rivaling the energy density of Lonely Mountain's spirit vein. His eyes shone. They took their first careful steps in. Someone actually tried to pluck the tablet out of the air, but it refused to budge. It cannot move until the gates are closed, explained Monkadil, his mocking gaze stuck on the warrior. That way, it can never be brought inside the pyramid, and the gates can always be opened. But in return, when the gate closes, it cannot be reopened for an hour. They stepped inside and found walls covered in murals and paintings of times long past. However, before Long could take a better look at them, a cold sensation struck him at the back of the neck, as if a sharp blade was suddenly resting there, ready to decapitate him. He shivered involuntarily then whipped his head around so quickly that his neck cracked. There in the distance, on top of the sphinx's head, stood a human figure with a cloak flowing in the wind behind it. The light illuminated the figure from behind, hiding its features, but Long couldn't help feeling a cold chill running down his spine. Whoever that person was, they were extremely strong. Killing intense swept out of the person's body uninhibited, rolling over the empty space and the destroyed camp before coming to focus on Long. He froze for a second, and the figure seemed to realize it had been spotted. With a burst of Herculean strength, it pushed itself off the Sphinx, sending little pieces of rock rolling down as it launched itself towards the pyramid at terrifying speeds. Long's heart was stuck in his throat. That person, whoever it was, was coming to kill him. Run! he shouted, and the wind shimmered blue as it violently and suddenly pushed everyone inside the pyramid, sending them rolling heads over heels on the hard stone. Long himself rushed inside as quickly as he could, reaching the edge of one stone gate in the blink of an eye. The gates! he shouted in panic. Shut them! Now! Hurry! Everyone was lost, but seeing Long's panic, some rushed for the gates and began pushing. The large stone blocks shuddered before they began moving slowly, way too slowly. But by now, more people had spotted the figure that was closing the distance faster than any horse ever could. The person's features were now barely visible, and some people even recognized him. That's, a person muttered, face paling, that's the hound of a nest. Long had no idea what that meant, but everyone else did. Their response was impressively swift and uniform, as if the mere mention of that name was enough to form a consensus. Shouts, screams, and roars resounded as all thirty people at once rushed for the stone gates and began pushing. The hound! bellowed Mastic in disbelief, pushing his shoulder against the stone as hard as he could. We're all gonna die! The thirty people pushed in unison, and the gates accelerated, picking up speed as they closed. But Brom the hound of a nest was also accelerating as he ran, and his speed was staggering. While those who had been left behind watched in muted terror, the thirty people inside gave it their all to push the gates faster. Skills were launched against the stone, the wind picked up, and even a small army of golems was doing its best with their little arms. The gates were almost closed by now, but the hound had already approached. He'd come so close, in fact, that Long could clearly make out his features. Hard eyes, short gray hair and mustache, and a large muscular body made for the sole purpose of annihilating his prey. Brom took the last steps and raised a hand, his wide eyes fixed on Long's own, his clenched fist shining like a beacon in the cultivator's spiritual sense. With the sound of stone hitting stone, the gate slammed shut, stealing all light from within the pyramid. A massive bang rang out, 
filling the corridor as the hound's fist collided against the massive stone gates, resounding so loudly that it shook everyone's ears. A second bang followed, and this one was even stronger, dust falling from the walls where it had lain for millennia. But the gates held, and Long leaned his back against a wall, gasping. He'd felt fear. That man had caused his spiritual sense to go haywire and his heart to be clenched by panic. Whoever he was, he was extremely strong, and he was after Long. At least he is locked out. For now. Who was that? he asked, looking around. It was impressive how terrified everyone was at the mention of the Hound of a Nest. Brom, the Hound of a Nest, explained Mastic, panting slightly as he walked alongside. An absolute butcher. When there's dirty business, that's who they send. I've heard of him, agreed Phil, shivering. He doesn't work for Lord Lawrence, the Lord of a Nest, but for Lord Howlin, the city's vice lord. Howlin is a shitty person, and the Hound is his right-hand man who handles everything dirty, loyal to the death. They say he once slaughtered an entire village because they delayed their tax payment. I've heard he burned down an orphanage because they couldn't afford to pay for protection. I think he once destroyed a church because the priest looked at him the wrong way. More people spoke of the Hound's fearsome achievements, and it sounded like everyone had a different rumor to mention. Long didn't believe all of them, of course, but some were bound to be true. Thankfully, nobody seemed to have realized that it was Long specifically who was in the Hound's sights. Why is that man after me? Could it be the quest? The Emperor knew of Long's name, so maybe others did as well. But who? And on what criteria had they been chosen? If the Hound of a Nest was after him, then it was probably the man's master, Howlin, who had given the command. So maybe only Grandmasters and above had received the quest? That would make sense. After all, anyone below the Grandmaster tier had a chance of falling to Long's hands, and the system should want anything but to enhance Long's fate by sending him passable challenges. Of course, a chance is only a chance. That hound was a peak master, and Long had no illusions of beating him unless he got very underhanded and very lucky. A burning gaze made Long raise his eyes. Monkadil was staring at him. Oh, realized the cultivator. He knows. But the monkey man chose not to say anything, or Long might well have been tied up and left here to pacify the hound. The reason for his silence was unknown, but Long felt great gratitude nonetheless. We must move. The gate will only remain closed for an hour, and then the hound will be after us again. We won't even be able to escape. The gates can be freely opened from inside, but that man will surely be waiting behind them. Our only hope is to find the masters and have them stop him, spoke Monkadil, turning towards the inside of the pyramid. He waved a hand, and a flame tongue appeared in front of him, floating ahead and illuminating the passage. Nodding in silent thanks, Long stood and finally took a look around. Murals decorated the walls, ancient cryptic murals. They depicted small people hoisting stone blocks and rolling them down a hill, and then larger people standing over the smaller ones. The murals also showed yellow valleys and green rivers, blue skies, and the endless desert. They showed a large hole, the cradle of earth where the pyramid and the ruined city now stood. The style of the murals was angular and crude, as if their creators had used only simple tools to shape the hard stone. And as they advanced down the corridor, the lit torches they'd brought along illuminated a change in the murals. From peaceful and descriptive, they went to violent, to depicting wars, famines, plagues. A man with a mane-like striped object around his head and a white extended jaw raised his hands into the air, blue lights shimmering on his fingertips. In front of him, dark clouds covered the sky over an army, raining lightning and death on his enemies. In another mural, Two large men fought above two armies of tiny humans, one tossing mountains at the other, while the second lopped miniature suns at his opponent. Wizards of old, whispered Phil, eyes shining, unable to contain his excitement. Humans with power before the system. They touched and weaved the threads of magic itself, imposing their will upon the world without need for a medium. Unlike the current age, very few could wield magic back then, making them kings amongst men. They kept advancing, and the murals increased in grandeur, 
finally coming to show a collection of many such wizards, each riding avatars of terrifying power, suns, oceans, storms, and deserts. They were not fighting. Instead, they were bowed towards a single person who stood above them all, a man with black eyes that looked up into the clouds towards which he was floating. Apotheosis, Phil gasped. Long turned to look at him. Like ascendance? he whispered, afraid to disturb this ancient place's calmness. The respect it commanded was palpable. Yes, the artificer whispered back. There were times when wizards were considered gods, back when the true gods were content to rest on their alabaster thrones and let the world unfold itself. This must be such a wizard, one stronger than his peers, so much stronger that he is worshipped instead of just respected. Notice how the others are all beings of great power, standing at the apex of all previous murals. But only now does the true pharaoh, that's what these rulers were called, appear. Wow, Mastic spoke softly from the side having approached along with Kat. What do these murals even mean? I think it's a story, replied Phil, turning his gaze to look at the various murals behind them. I think they speak of a great empire, how it was founded and flourished, how it suffered when the world was against it, and how beings of great power rose among its ranks and fought to protect it. And they speak of the empire's pharaoh, the one who achieved a breakthrough and stood above all other beings of power, as if he was a god. A god? Cat gasped. Not a real one, he corrected her, shaking his head. Murals always exaggerate, especially in graves. That's what this pyramid is, by the way. Someone's tomb. Probably this person's. Hence why these murals exaggerate his achievements so much. He had probably attained the power of a grandmaster, or even a saint, allowing him to be worshipped by millions. Or maybe his power was lower. There is no telling what the power distribution was like back then, and any records we have are incomplete or contrast each other. But still, he continued, sighing and raising a hand to gently touch the carved stone, for a person to have such an extravagant place of burial, what a life he must have lived. He caressed the bottom of the tall mural in awe, barely reaching the waist of the bowed wizards. As he did, Long's eyes widened, snapping out of the educational trance he'd been placed in. Wait, don't! But it was too late. As Phil's hand touched the wall, the entire corridor began to shake and vibrate. From ahead, Monkadil snapped back at them. Idiots! Everyone struggled to keep their balance as the stone moaned, the sound of creaking wood filling their ears. The next moment, the floor under their feet gave way, revealing a pitch-black hole under it. Long summoned the wind to his assistance, but it was too little, too late. He barely managed to keep his group and a few others afloat, but even that effort was quickly abandoned. Out of the darkness, a single dart flew out, sticking itself in the side of Long's throat. Eyes going wide, he grabbed the dart and pulled it out, watching a drop of green liquid drip from its tip. Damn, was all he had time to whisper before the world went dark and his wind abated. And just like that, in a screaming spiral illuminated only by stray torches, they fell. Chapter 35 Phil the Explorer Phil awoke with a start. Not only was he in the dark, but he was alone as well. Oh, shit! He jumped to his feet, eyes looking around in wide panic. Nothing. Pitch black. Darker than even the Snow Queen's, a famous saint, evil twin. The air itself felt incredibly heavy and dry, as if it hadn't been circulated in a hundred years. His mouth opened in reflex to scream, but he barely held it in. Who knew what the darkness hid? Maybe if he just stayed silent. Phil's heart beat crazily, and waiting was torture, but waiting was all he could do. A moment passed, then another. Thankfully, nothing jumped at him out of the dark, though just the idea of something lurking right in front of him was terrifying. He even thought he felt a cold breath from behind, but Phil still had the presence of mind to consider it a self-induced illusion. But shivering as he was, Phil's mind was strong. His will clamped down on his primal instincts like an iron vice, grabbing the fear and tossing it to a corner of his mind. He earned a breather. He was still afraid, of course, but it felt isolated. He could act. 
With a shallow breath, he willed a golem out of his spatial ring. The artifact could be operated at will, thank the gods, and the golems lacked eyes, so they had no need for light in the first place. Along with the golem came a torch and flint, and Phil ordered the little humanoid to light it post-haste. He jumped at the sound of scratching flint, but the light soon spread out, pushing the darkness away and revealing the place he sat in. Two rows of black stone statues stood beside Phil, and they gave him a good fright before realizing they were just that, statues. Humanoid they were, and feminine, but with the head of a cat. They each held a hand out, as if waiting for a soft handshake, but Phil wasn't going to give them one. That's creepy as hell. He shivered again, surrounded by stone statues in the twilight. In fact, their slender forms seemed to move and waver in the dancing shadows cast by the torch, introducing a new worry to Phil's fear-addled mind. No, calm down, Phil, he told himself. Statues are statues, no matter how creepy they are. They cannot harm you. Shaking his head, he forced his eyes to look beyond the cat women. A rectangular stone room stretched around him, its long side maybe ten meters long and the short five. There was only one large closed stone door to be seen, while stone walls encircled the room, covered in dusty murals of a time long past. There was also a dark hole in the wall right behind him, angling steeply upwards, probably where he'd fallen from. Come to think of it, why am I still alive? And where is everyone? We fell into a trap, and then... and then... darkness? But who would set up a trap that just led to other rooms? Plus, a trap that splits us up? Maybe that one hole branched into multiple, and different people fell into different rooms. Or different deaths. Still, this is weird. Is this place meant to test us instead of kill us? That's so needlessly complicated. I wonder what went through that pharaoh's mind. Maybe it's a cultural thing? Testing people and rewarding the strong? Then what happens to the weak? Death, probably. Oh no, I'm weak. I'm gonna die. Okay, okay, I need a plan. Step one, avoid all danger until Long comes to pick me up. That's it, nice plan. But what if he never finds me here? Should I try opening that door? Hmm, yes, that could work. I mean, it's just a door, right? How bad could it be? Snapping out of his thoughts, Phil's eyes fell back on the wall surrounding him specifically their intricate murals. He could see a bipedal lioness who held a large scale in front of her. A feather was balanced on one side of the scales, while a row of weird orbs seemed to be heading towards the other side. Of those, a single orb was placed on the scales, which seemed to have reached an equilibrium. Temporarily entranced, Phil grabbed the torch from the golem's hands, giving a nod as thanks, and raised it up high to illuminate the rest of the walls. Various scenes were depicted, all including those orbs. In some murals, the orbs were heading for a dark river where a dog-headed humanoid awaited. In others, they were torn apart and devoured by the bipedal lioness, the blood on her lips adding to the image's savagery. Another scene, this one of more interest to Phil, showed large scarabs tearing apart a gray human figure. Closer to the door, there was also one scene where the orbs lay peacefully on a field, surrounded by food and drinks. In fact, as one got farther away from the door, the orb seemed to be having a worse and worse time in each mural, culminating in the lioness devouring them. But the original mural, the one with the lioness weighing the orbs against a feather, seemed to be the main theme of the room. It was copied on all four walls, with the four copies sporting slight differences to each other, as was expected by the work of mortal sculptors. Weighting orbs against a feather? What is that supposed to mean? Are these orbs meant to signify souls? He wondered, cupping his chin. Phil hadn't delved much in history, but his general interest meant he had read some things. These walls were... intriguing. Oh, what he wouldn't give to study them at his leisure, in the safety of his own home. As things were, he would like nothing more than to get as far away from them as possible. Who knew what might happen? The statues could come alive and attack him. Something might be hiding behind them, or something might be hiding behind him. He turned around so quickly that the torch flame wavered. There was nothing, 
and he sighed in thin relief. Ah, what am I even doing here? He lamented, a question he'd frequently been asking himself as of late. This is not why I left the village. I wanted to be a scholar, not an explorer. Dad will be so pissed if he finds out. Perhaps I should have just stayed home and become a blacksmith. How is someone like me suited to adventuring? I'm small and weak, and I get scared easily, and I don't like fighting, and I don't want to be left alone in a dark room with creepy statues. I am just a scholar. But then again, how am I suited to being a scholar either? I quit at the first sign of a different opportunity. I could have just toiled away for a few years until I became a senior researcher, or at least until that asshole Blom left the team. Damn it, why was I so lazy? I wish Long was here. He's brave. He'd know what to do. But all the world's doubts combined could never lead anywhere. Phil was alone in a place that terrified him, and there was no guarantee of anyone coming to save him. He had to save himself. He gulped, making himself as small as he could in fear and hesitation. Slowly, he took a step. Then another. Nothing jumped out to eat him, which was good. Perhaps this room was safe. Unless it wasn't. Dragging his steps, Phil walked away from the two rows of statues and approached the door. But as he did, something on the floor caught his eye. A square on the floor clearly delineated from the rest of it through straight lines. Looking closely, the meter-wide square wasn't as simple as it looked. It was split into nine smaller squares, with eight of them occupied by stone tiles, while the middle position was left empty. Each of these tiles had symbols drawn on its surface, an assortment of random lines, and Phil frowned at them. Hmm. He leaned in closer. There were exactly three lines on each tile, crisscrossing with each other, and forming a variety of patterns. He could see one that resembled a three-way spiral, where all three lines converged to the center, but he could see another that was a confusing web. The symbols were... strange, but they seemed purposeful. There was something hiding there. Was it a puzzle? He looked up at the door. There were no handles or anything to move it by, and it looked despairingly heavy. Phil's gaze went back to the tiles. Grooves could be seen around them, indicating the ability to slide. He looked at the door, then back at the tiles. So a puzzle, he concluded. Nine positions for eight tiles. I must slide each tile in its correct position for the door to open. The empty spot in the middle serves to facilitate the tile's movements. He had actually seen similar puzzles before. It wasn't the most difficult of concepts to come up with. Therefore, there are two stages. One, find the pattern. Two, manage to slide them properly. Phil cupped his chin in thought, the fear slowly receding further and further away from the forefront of his mind. This was a puzzle, a challenge, and Phil entered a familiar state. He faced challenges constantly in his job, and he had long become good at tackling them. His mind raced with possibilities, coming up with possible patterns and discarding them, starting from simple solutions before heading to more complicated ones. He viewed the problem from different perspectives, trying different things until something worked. Solving the problem took him five seconds. Ah, he exclaimed inwardly. The number of lines is the same in all tiles, but the number of intersections is not. One, two, three, eight. That's it. I have to array them by the number of intersections, but starting from which corner? It was a square after all, so there were many symmetrical placements that would work. Phil frowned, not finding any other clues. Could all solutions be correct? Ah. He raised his eyes, once again taking in the murals on the walls. They depicted various scenes, each containing the orbs that probably symbolized souls, but not all walls had the same number of orbs. In fact, each wall, and each edge between walls, had a different mural as its centerpiece, and these murals all contained a different number of orbs, from one to eight. All right, so I have to align each tile with the wall or edge that has the same number of orbs. The tile with two intersections, for example, will be placed at the rightmost position, as the right wall contains exactly two orbs. Then does the middle position remain empty? He looked up 
finding the ceiling above the puzzle conveniently empty of murals. That confirmed his hypothesis. Phil smiled in satisfaction. What an amusing puzzle, though a bit too easy. Was it supposed to be difficult? I don't see how anyone could fail this, given a couple of minutes. There could be other solutions, of course, but he was certain there were no simpler ones. At that point, any other solution would just be a bad design. He did a double-take, just to be sure, but found no traps or things he'd overlooked. Phil was confident he'd found the solution. The tiles weren't even arrayed too far from the target pattern. Whoever had scrambled them up had done a terrible job. Humming, he bent down and slid the first tile. The room shook, and the artificer widened his eyes. A time limit? With the shaking came a soft buzzing, as if from far away, and Phil wasn't going to sit there and wait to see what caused it. Quickly, he slid the tiles exactly five more times, reaching the target pattern. The grooves were a bit dusty themselves, requiring a small push to move a tile through them the first time, but doing so a second time was effortless. In no time at all, Phil had arranged them perfectly, and he nodded to himself. The buzzing softened until it disappeared. The room shook again, turning his smug look back into one of fear, and then one of relief as the door slid open, noisily. The sound of stone rubbing against stone was loud and irritating, and the room's closed walls echoed it back at Phil, making him grimace. But the door eventually opened, and the sound stopped. Phil cowered. A dark passage was revealed beyond, stretching to the left and right. That's all he could see. Perfect. Another dark place. The room was safe, but will the corridor be safe too? I don't think so. Plus, where there's one corridor, there's more of them, as well as rooms. I wonder what the pyramid's interior is shaped like. A palace? A maze? Maybe I should just close the door and wait here for someone to find me. Oh, but what if they never find me? What if they leave the pyramid without me? I'll be left here alone, and I will starve to death. Or rather, die of dehydration. Alone, in the dark, in an abandoned room under an ancient pyramid. He gulped. It seemed that he would have to go explore, whether he wanted to or not. But then, his eyes shone. Come out, he whispered, and a small army of knee-tall golems appeared in front of him one by one. He counted fifteen of them, including two injured by the previous fight against the scorpion. The familiar drain on his mana could be felt almost immediately, but with his recent level ups, he could deal with it for around half an hour. Hey there, little guys, he whispered again, crouching down to be on their eye level. The golem stood straight and looked at him, awaiting orders. He gave a half-smile. If only everyone listened to me like that. You must explore, he ordered them softly. Words weren't strictly needed to transmit his orders, but it helped him focus. Plus, he liked speaking to them, the same way he enjoyed thinking of them as little humans, even if they weren't strictly sapient. Golems were nice. You must explore the layout for me. On every intersection, mark each passage as safe with a circle or dangerous with an X. Also, mark the passages leading to dead ends with a square. But be sneaky. If you find enemies you are not certain you can defeat, return and report. If you find friends, lead them here. Sneakily. Got it? As one, the golems bowed, and Phil blinked in surprise. Oh, they must have picked that up from the kobolds. Long's weirdness is infectious. Am I going to start bowing? By the gods. The golems stood up, split into two groups, and headed down the two stretches of corridor, sneakily. Phil puffed his chest out in pride. And now, he thought with a satisfied grin, marveling at his own genius, we hide. He rushed back into the room, hiding in the shadows behind a statue and extinguishing his torch. He also summoned Darter and Bomboy, asking them to hide and watch out for enemies while he couldn't see. The stone door couldn't close again, unfortunately, but it didn't matter too much. Nobody would search an empty room, right? Chapter 36 Phil the Explorer, but with ass-kicking Oh. With a drawn-out groan, Mastic's eyes slowly fluttered open, but he saw nothing. He waited a moment for his vision to return, 
before realizing that he could see just fine. It was the light that was absent. His head swam, turning in the darkness with no sense of direction. The silence was deafening, and even when he moved, his limbs made no sound, though he felt the thin fabric slide against the cool flat stone underneath. Lost in the bottomless darkness, with no sight or hearing, Mastic felt alone, abandoned, deserted, forgotten. Ignoring the persistent nausea, he shook his head in protest, shoving the dark thoughts away. He did not need them. Not anymore. Not now. Not ever. That man was gone. At least the shaking of his head produced a sound, reassuring him that this was not death. Hey, he whispered, his voice piercing the thick darkness and dissolving into it. He didn't dislike the feeling. Tearing the darkness apart was the best way to escape it. Hey, Mastic kissed again, this time a bit more boldly. Mastic, came a flat voice from the side, and though distorted, he could tell it was Cat's. Her voice carried no emotion, only the calm acceptance of death. Am I dead? No, the bard reassured her. Just a bit lost. Where are you? Well, I'm... The voice drifted over expanding to fill the darkness and making it impossible to determine its origin. I'm just a bit lost, I guess. Mastic paused, then chuckled. It was still pitch black around, but somehow everything suddenly felt more manageable. Wait there, he said. Wherever you are, I'll find us some light. Experimentally, he moved his arms and legs, and everything felt fine. Barring the all-encompassing ache, of course— but that was to be expected when you fell from so high up. He did not even remember most of it, just darkness and then sliding down a spiral before everything went dark, or, well, darker. With slow movements, he stood, rising slowly until he reached his full height. Nothing happened. He reached for the inner pocket of his jacket, where he always kept various useful things, and fished out a box of matches. Opening it, he felt a match's wooden end and grabbed it, scratching it against the box's rough side. He tried once, then twice. The match caught on fire, the small explosion of light blinding in the absolute darkness. Mastic blinked, giving his eyes time to adjust, but a scream from the side forced him to focus. A foreign creature stood in front of him, silently staring him down. It had black fur, barely visible against the darkness. A dog's body stood upright on the legs of a human, with its sharp features and open, fanged mouth barely a step away from Mastic. The creature stretched out a hand to grab him, and Mastic fell on his ass, screaming like a little girl. Relax, you idiot, Cat laughed from the side, her eyes having apparently adjusted much faster than his. It's just a statue. A what? It took him a second to calm down. Taking a better look, the creature was indeed a statue depicting a dog-like humanoid. There were several of them, in fact, all arrayed in two rows next to him and Cat, barely visible among the flame's small dancing shadows. Speaking of the girl, the thief's black form-fitting suit blended in with the darkness better than even the statue's, with only her brown eyes visible and reflecting the match's light. What an idiot, she snorted in amusement. Me? You screamed too, didn't you? That was only to scare you, she shot back, rolling her eyes. Given that her eyes were all that Masta could see of her, the gesture was quite exaggerated. But as he looked around, his annoyance turned into grimness. Where are the others? he asked, to which Cat frowned, or at least he assumed she did. I don't know. I only remember falling and then waking up next to you. Yeah, I get that a lot. She blinked slowly, eyeing him blankly. Containing the smirk that wanted to surface on his lips, he approached so that he could actually see her face instead of just her eyes. In any case, he continued, it looks like we've been separated from the others. I only remember falling and sliding, then darkness. That's so needlessly complicated. Cat frowned again, and her round eyes looked downward in thought. If they have a pitfall trap, why angle the stone under it to reduce our momentum? I'd expect spikes, or even pyramidic spikes, to be on theme, but this is just... weird. Whoever made that trap clearly didn't intend to kill us, even though they could, 
Mastic agreed, cupping his chin. In the dim light of a single match, the two stood close, allowing the darkness to swallow anything but each other's faces. Maybe this is a test. As weird as it sounds, I can't think of anything else. It would also fit in with the key's function at the pyramid gates, where the tablet key cannot be carried inside the pyramid. If you intend to protect your tomb against looters, why do that? Why even create a key in the first place? So the pharaoh who's buried here wanted his tomb to be sullied? She cocked a brow. I don't buy it. It was a different culture back then, Mastic shrugged. Perhaps it was common to leave their treasures behind for the worthy. Phil might know, if we can find him. Kat shook her head, brown hair swaying along with it. It doesn't matter. Rich people are always weird. Whatever their purpose, all we have to do is steal their belongings and bail. He grinned. Now that's something I could get behind. Kat raised two fingers, licking them and then pressing them against the match's flame. She extinguished it, sinking them both into darkness. Why did you do that? Master cried out. I can't see anything. I can. Don't be a wuss. I, he complained, crossing his arms. I just don't trust you, okay? I'm not a wuss. Sure. With a scratch of flint on flint, the room lit up again, this time much brighter than before. Cat was holding a torch up high, staring at the walls. There, she said. Much better, right? Where did you find that? He asked, agape. It fell with us. Now come, we need to get moving. The hound will only stay outside for an hour, and who knows how long we were unconscious for. In the bright torchlight, the two could finally take a good look at the space surrounding them. It seemed to be a rectangular room that was not too big, with clear-cut corners and a flat floor. Mastic and Cat were placed by the back wall, close to a gaping dark hole that angled steeply upwards, probably where they'd fallen from. Two rows of statues stretched at their sides, extending down the room in a straight line towards the far wall, forming a corridor of sorts. At the end of the room stood a stone door, shut and with no obvious handles to it. As for the walls themselves, they were filled with murals of orbs, a lioness, and a dog-headed man. In fact, unbeknownst to them, this room was very similar to Phil's. Yeah, like we're here for sightseeing, said Mastic as he turned his back to the murals and looked at the hole behind them, leading sharply upwards. It was slippery, too, making the climb difficult, if not impossible. There is a door, Cat spoke hesitantly. Perhaps we could try that? The two advanced in the room cautiously, shaking off the intrusive feeling of the statue's many stone eyes on them. Arriving at the stone door, two things quickly became apparent. One, the door would not open easily. There were no handles to speak of, and pushing it achieved nothing. Two, the square of symbols embedded on the floor in front of the door was probably important. They crouched down, Cat shining the torchlight on the weird square. Looking closely, the meter-wide square wasn't as simple as it looked. Eight stone tiles were placed in a square hole, filling it up completely, save for an empty space in the middle where a ninth tile could fit. Each tile had symbols drawn on them, lines crisscrossing in seemingly random patterns, and neither Cat nor Master could make heads or tails of them. In fact, unbeknownst to them, this was the exact same puzzle that Phil had faced. What the hell is this? muttered the bard. Look! Cat reached out, pointing a finger at the tiles. There are grooves around them. I think we are supposed to slide them into a specific pattern. Slide them? Mastic placed a palm on a tile, lightly pushing it towards the empty spot in the middle. After some original resistance, where dust had accumulated in the grooves, the tile moved effortlessly, sliding into the middle position with a click. Huh he said after a short, surprised pause. So we just have to find the pet. A low rumble shook the ground, making them both jolt upwards. What the hell was that? yelled Mastic, grabbing Cat's hand and using it to swipe the torch around, dragging the little thief along. What the- Hey! She pulled herself away, frowning at the bard. There's nothing there, idiot. And if there was, what were you gonna do? Fight an earthquake? Shh! He brought a finger to his lips, and Kat stopped talking immediately. I can hear something, can't you? She frowned before her eyes widened. Is that? 
With light steps, she approached the closer statue and turned her ear towards it. It's buzzing, she said, voice shaking. Something is buzzing inside the statue. Something is buzzing inside all the statues, the bard spoke from next to the opposite statue. His eyes widened. And it's getting louder by the second. Cat, I think we might be in trouble. Oh no, Mastic, the tiles, she suddenly exclaimed in realization. It's a puzzle. There is a time limit. Gaze is crossing. They both jumped back to the tile-filled square and began inspecting it intently, looking for the mysterious pattern. Adrenaline and the fear of death have a way of sharpening one's mind threefold, but even with that, there are things that can be done and things that cannot. As they stared at the tiles and the symbols drawn on them, racking their brains to figure the pattern out, neither Mastic nor Cat could come up with anything. No matter how hard they looked, the symbols still looked completely random. The buzzing slowly but surely intensified, to the point where it was now clearly audible. The statues even began to vibrate slightly, and the two were panicking faster and faster. Screw it, said Mastic and grabbed a tile, pulling it away from the ground with all of his strength. It didn't budge in the slightest. Mastic, do something, screamed Cat, hand reflexively grasping her dagger's hilt. I'm trying, he bellowed. Out of options, he simply grabbed the tiles and began randomly mashing them around as quickly as he could, hoping to get it right by luck. Alas, luck favors the bold, not the unskilled. God damn it, he shouted, smashing his fists against the tiles. Why make it so damn difficult? Mastic! A shout from behind drew his attention. Turning around, he watched a statue in horror. Out of its open mouth crawled a beetle, as large as his open palm, and with mandibles the size of his finger. Its shell was brown with blue stripes, and even as they watched, the beetle shook its body and opened its shell, allowing its wings to unfold before testing them. Immortal Scarab Level 1 Immortal scarabs are carnivorous insects, fighting with numbers and steel-tipped mandibles. They are famed for their ability to hibernate for exceedingly long periods of time when food is scarce, hence their name. In a swarm, these scarabs can be exceedingly dangerous. As the first scarab experimentally took to the air, more scarabs crawled out of the nearby statues, each slowly lifting off. Even as Mastic and Cat watched, the scarabs buzzed in midair, forming a swarm that constantly increased in size. And behind the two of them, the door remained stubbornly shut. The buzzing had intensified to the point where it filled the entire room by now, hammering against their ears and enhancing their fear. It had also lost its subdued tone as the scarabs kept escaping the statues, like a blocked flood finally let loose. Unfortunately, figuring out the purpose of the scarabs was not as difficult as solving the puzzle. They were killers, and they would devour Mastic and Cat to the bone. They shivered in terror. Eaten by scarabs in the darkness in a stale room under an ancient pyramid was not how anyone dreamed of dying. Terror led to despair, and despair led to resolve. In a dark flash, two curved daggers appeared in Cat's hands, their crimson tips glistening in the torchlight. Mastic's eyes were wide open in madness as he pressed a golden flute tight to his lips. The swarm recoiled, spinning around itself before freezing in the air, staring at them. Chapter 37 The Bard and the Shadow Witch Mastic and Cat did not wait for the swarm to move first. A sharp note rang out, cutting through the deafening buzzing despite the said buzzing's intensity. Cat's vision doubled over for a moment, and her head felt like someone had driven a burning nail inside it. But the next moment, the feeling was gone. The swarm was in clear disarray, but not dead. Cat intended to change that. Willing the torchlight's many shadows to move under her feet, she dashed forth, emboldened by the swarm's temporary weakness. Her twin daggers flashed red, tearing through the scarabs in a shower of blood and violence. Under the sharp blades, forged in blue fire and honed in crimson blood, the scarab's shells were useless, only serving as momentary delays. She flashed inside the swarm in a maelstrom of red, bleeding lines, and she flashed back out immediately afterward. The swarm's weakness wouldn't last forever, and she didn't intend to test the limits of Mastic's skill. 
Two dozen scarabs had been felled in that short span, but the damn insects were still trickling out of the dog-faced statue's mouths. Their rate of emergence was slowing down now, but there were already well over a hundred of the little man-eating beasts. Level one or not, she could not handle that many at once. But she had to, because the fool behind her could not hold his own. And if he fell, so would she. Kat gritted her teeth. On second thought, perhaps not testing the limits of the swarm's disarray was a stupid choice. The swarm recovered. Banding together, the scarabs lunged at her, their droning drowning out all other sounds and even her thoughts. For a moment, the world was only scarabs, and she was helpless. Tens of steel-fanged mandibles reached for her, aiming to peel her skin from the bones. But she refused to let them. She had sacrificed everything to become stronger, to survive, and she would not die like this. The shadows flared around her, and the torchlight receded. As the shadows danced, Kat's limbs stretched, getting lost in the absence of light. She was not a person, but a ghost, a patch of darkness in a veil of darker darkness. Her form blurred until its limits could not be clearly seen. She was everywhere and nowhere. She was a shadow. She was the Shadow Witch, and underneath her tight clothes and brown cloak, a small medallion shone blue. The wind raced away from her, billowing her hair outwards, creating a bubble of force around her body. Under the all-consuming droning, she thought she felt a faint melody reaching her ears, heightening her reflexes and giving her speed. Good. She would need it. The scarab swarm reached her, tens of them attacking at once. The insects dove for Kat's body, wrapped in shadows as it was. Each felt like an arrow as they zoomed past her, but they only pierced the darkness harmlessly, tearing holes in her billowing cloak and cutting strands off her billowing hair. The combination of shadow and wind worked. Her form was blurry and the scarabs were missing, while the blowing wind pushed them outwards and altered their trajectory away from her. And as the scarabs missed her, Cat's daggers flashed with darkness, becoming one with the shadows as they tore and hacked, swiveled and turned, flashed and bled. Crimson lines formed in the air, only to be immediately swallowed by the shadows, but each line cut clean through a passing scarab, sending halves of them toppling to the ground behind her. But the swarm was large, and she was alone. As much as she obstructed them, some were bound to hit. The scarabs aiming for her torso could not be pushed far enough, and shallow, bloody gashes were torn in her extremities as the medallion's wind protected her vitals. She felt the pain but had no time to scream because her mind was sharp as a blade, her eyes one with the daggers. She was handing out death as the scarabs came, jumping straight into her steel-bladed jaws. Cat's grandeur of power ended as quickly as it came. She was killing some, but most of the scarabs simply flew by her, and they quickly returned for a second strike. Belatedly, Kat realized that her actions had placed her in the middle of the swarm, and flying scarabs were coming in from every direction, mandibles outstretched. Even if her wind medallion and shadow camouflage could work overtime, there was no stopping this many attacks. She immediately stopped her attacks and fell to the ground, trying to crawl her way out of certain death. She sent a human-shaped shadow flying upwards to distract the scarabs and they ignored it. Hidden in the shadows, Kat's face blanched as half the scarabs ignored her shadow bait and dived straight for her instead. They were almost upon her lying body, mandibles poised to rip her apart. They would pierce right through her, bones and all. There was nothing she could do. Time seemed to slow down until it froze, and a crystal-clear note broke the space around her. Or so it seemed. The sound was so clear and so sudden that it completely flooded her adrenaline-addled mind, replacing her every sensation and thought. For a moment, the world was white. Then she blinked and the shock washed away, allowing her to regain control of her body. Immobilized scarabs lay on and around her, some having drawn blood due to simple inertia, but none having injured her deeply. Mastic! she mentally yelled in joy, but there was no time to think further. Her daggers, still clasped in her hands, flashed once more. There were no shadows this time, no tricks. Without even standing up, she moved her arms as quickly as she possibly could, and then even faster, 
her muscles numbing as they strained to control the swift movements. Even as they began to recover, the scarabs were sliced and diced into pieces. Blue blood covered Kat's body, but there was no time to care as she jumped to her feet, once again readying herself. She was exhausted and terrified, but a third of the original swarm was still alive, and they had just snapped out of whatever mindfuckery Mastic had employed. Kat couldn't look back, but the bard must have been exhausted as well, possibly out of mana. The spell that immobilized even her, a peak class, couldn't have been cheap. The swarm buzzed and droned in fury, mandibles clicking in vindictive revenge for their fallen kin. They poised for a charge and stopped in their tracks. A new melody entered Kat's ears, but it was unlike the previous battle tones. This sound was soothing and calming and beautiful. It reminded Kat of successfully escaping the guards with a hot loaf in hand. It reminded her of Mother Erlene, of her bread's warmth, of the safety her attic offered to Kat and the other children of the streets. It was a melody that spoke of relief, a song of peace and relaxation. It sang about home. In the face of Mastic's song, Kat easily maintained herself. It was an impressive song, but not magical, just pleasant. But for the scarabs, it was different. They seemed dazed as they hovered in midair, and one by one they landed, their wing beats slowing down until it was silent. There were around fifty of them left, and they all stood peacefully on the stone floor, mandibles clicking slowly. Turning around, Cat saw Mastic playing his flute, his tanned skin shining bronze under his cloak and half-unrolled turban. His amber eyes were half-closed, and despite its raggedy look, his body exuded serenity as if he was merely playing the flute alone on a field. It was a striking image, and she had to blink to focus. She turned to the scarabs. There was no way Mastic could keep this up for long, but he didn't need to. Before the scarabs could understand what was happening, her daggers could cleave through most of them, and the rest would follow. Only, Cat was a thief, and she always kept an eye open for opportunities. Don't stop, she spoke softly, afraid to disturb the song's calmness as she reached inside her cloak. When her hands emerged again, they were holding a brown urn, the urn of broken sand, the item that Long and Monkadil had fought over in front of the Sphinx. For someone of her capabilities, acquiring it had been laughably easy. She grabbed the urn's lid and twisted it open. With a pop, a small suction force appeared, making the air in front of Cat rotate. Taking a step forward, she approached the immortal scarabs and extended the open urn towards them. Dazed as they were, the insects followed the suction, allowing it to pull them into the urn. Strangely, even though it seemed capable of fitting at most two or three of them, all fifty scarabs walked inside without a problem. Softly, Cat placed the lid back and twisted it shut with a click, then placed the urn back inside her cloak. You can stop now, she said softly, and Mastic's music stopped immediately as he fell to the ground, coughing and clutching his chest. His peaceful image dispersed to reveal a ragged, exhausted man struggling to breathe. Cat simply waited. Was that, he spoke after a moment, what I think it was? Perhaps. She looked him in the eye. Are you going to tell anyone? About the urn of broken sand, or about your elite class? Mine? What about your own elite class? She retorted. Mastic smirked back. Both of them were peak classed, but both had just displayed enough power to almost rival a master. Elite classes allowed a person to fight above their level, but they were rare, and revealing your power was not always wise. You're playing with fire, girl. That's exactly how I like it. Exchanging a conspiratory look, the two nodded at each other. Nice job there, said the thief. Back at you, Mastic grinned. There's no way I could have done it alone. Even hypnotizing a third of the swarm was stretching me thin. You're a terrible liar. On the contrary, I am quite an excellent one. She stuck her tongue out, and he winked, pearly white teeth contrasting his amber eyes as he smiled. So what now? I don't know. Mastic scratched his head. Maybe we just have to solve the writ. 
Before he could even finish his words, the eight tiles shone brown. With the heavy screech of stone rubbing against stone, the door slid open, revealing a dark corridor. Cat raised a brow. Well, that was easier than expected. Maybe pest removal is a worthy task in the eyes of the late pharaoh. But the door made some noise, she frowned, and Mastic completed her thought. Which might draw trouble if there are more enemies behind that door. With Cat grabbing the torch from where she dropped it, the two carefully but quickly crossed the stone threshold, finding themselves in the middle of a long stone corridor that extended in either direction. Similar to the scarab room, these walls were filled with murals, though not as extravagant as those at the pyramid's entrance. These ones depicted human figures tending to several mundane chores, sweeping the floor, dusting off furniture, all those were there. But there were also several depictions of humans killing other, larger humans. Above all these, on the ceiling, a black-eyed figure, the pharaoh, lounged on a throne, watching everything unfold. The pharaoh was quite large, as were the humans that were getting killed. In contrast, the ones who did chores or killed others were all smaller in comparison, perhaps symbolizing their inferiority. Above the stone door they'd just crossed, the sign of a scale was painted, with a coin in one hand and a scarab in the other. It enhanced their impression that the room they just crossed was a test for the worthy. Of course, these all take time to describe, but Cat and Mastic saw it all in one eye sweep. As soon as they'd exited, they turned around and grabbed the stone door, attempting to slide it back into place. It didn't budge. The doors of this pyramid are really starting to get on my nerves, muttered Mastic. Then, without dallying, they walked away towards the left stretch of the corridor, always on the lookout for traps. The corridor twisted and turned as they silently followed it. They walked past many doors like the one they'd crossed, identical even up to the signs of scales etched above them, but all were closed. With their previous experience, they didn't try to open any of them. The doors here could be quite stubborn. But besides doors, they also chanced upon many intersections where other tunnels crossed their own, all with similar murals snaking their walls. All intersections headed towards their right, making them think that they were circling the edge of the pyramid's main part in a clockwise fashion. They kept following a straight path for a while, with the hope that Long and Phil had ended up in a similar room to them, but they eventually decided that this was getting them nowhere. Turning right at the next intersection, they headed deeper. And as they did, the intersections increased in frequency, quickly becoming so many that Mastic and Cat started marking their path, using the thief's daggers to chip the stone corners. And all the while, the oppressive stone walls and ceiling loomed over their heads as if to suffocate them. The darkness was trying to smother their only source of light that would eventually run out. This place was turning out to be a maze. And, to their horror, a low sound suddenly cut through the silence. It was barely there, but it was. A soft, raspy sound, like sandpaper dragged over rock. They froze. Cat grabbed Mastic's arm and squeezed it in fear. Mastic, she whispered in as hushed a voice as she could. Something's there. He gulped, and in the pyramid's desolate silence, it sounded as if he'd just struck a gong. But the raspy sound kept on, without rising in volume. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to have noticed them yet. That was good. Eyes narrowing, Mastic pointed forward. Cat's eyes widened, and she shook her head. He pointed again. She refused. Mastic grabbed her arm and pulled her close. If something's chasing us, he hissed in her ear, brown hair tickling his nose, we need to know what it is. Cat threw him a hard glare, then looked away in acceptance. Do whatever you want, she seemed to imply. Eyes hardening, Mastic let go of her and stepped forth. His silk shoes slid over the rock underneath, silently like a snake. The murals around him were heavy. With each step he took, their eyes seemed glued on him, ready to reveal his presence. It was difficult. It felt as if he was sneaking while being watched. But he kept at it, because these were mere murals. They had no eyes. It was an illusion caused by the heavy air and the stifling darkness, only kept at bay by the torch he held. Mastic's eyes widened. The torch! And at the same time, the sound picked up like sandpaper getting dragged over rock, fast. 
With a muffled curse, he threw the torch away and rushed at Cat, grabbing her hand. I cannot see in the dark, he whispered frantically. You must lead me. Now, run! She didn't need to be told twice. She dashed through the corridors, turning randomly at the first corner and then continuing ahead, and Mastic did his best to keep up. She did not let go of him and matched his pace, even if she was much faster, though he had no doubt she would abandon him in a heartbeat if their hunter approached. Not that he blamed her for it. He would have done the same. Their hearts beat like two drums, racing against each other to be the fastest. Mastic didn't even know his heart could beat that fast. Be it the darkness, the enclosed space, the stuffy air, or the imposing murals, he was absolutely terrified, not to mention whatever monstrosity was after them. Thankfully, the sound of their pursuer abated quickly. Apparently, it wouldn't pursue, and the two breathed out in relief. But as they looked backward, relief morphed into fear. Because on the tunnel's wall behind them, where an intersection was, fell the shadow of their pursuer, as cast by the torch Mastic had dropped. And it was hideous. A humanoid, its gigantic form stretching from floor to ceiling, with sharp claws for hands and a round head. But what truly made it repulsive was the way its form seemed to have angles as if made of squares. It moved rigidly, hands stretched out front, while something was dragging behind it, a piece of cloth like a bandage. But before Mastic and Cat could stomach the thought, Another creature appeared next to the first one, then another, and another. They looked at each other, each seeing their own terror reflected in the other's eyes. In these dark tunnels, something hideous was waiting, moving, searching, hunting them. Chapter 38 Straying from the Beaten Path When Long's eyes opened, he saw darkness, nothing. So he simply spread out his spiritual perception. With that, he could see perfectly in the dark, though some details were foggy. The first thing he noticed was the ceiling slowly sliding over him. Some black-eyed dude, a mural, was eyeing him from up there, possibly in puzzlement because ceilings are not supposed to move. Long withdrew his perception and released it again, performing what was called a spiritual blink. No. It wasn't the ceiling that was moving. He was, just horizontally, looking upwards. His body felt rigid, sore as if it wasn't fully his. His temples drummed slowly and distantly. His back felt off, like he was receiving a massage, or as if many hands were holding... Ah, it's the golems. Thanks, Phil. But when he angled his perception to the side, what he found were not Phil's golems. Instead, he saw a humanoid covered in rough, yellowed-out bandages, looking as old as time. Its head was round, while its face was also covered in bandages, save for openings around its fang-filled mouth and its pupilless eyes. These eyes were red and murky, and through them, the gaze of a devil stared back at Long. He screamed and thrashed, escaping the grasp of the hands under his back and falling flat on the ground, which was much closer than he expected. Adrenaline filling his rigid body, he unleashed a ring of air around him, pushing the creatures away before they could capitalize on his weakness. In a single leap, he was upright, sword already in hand, and ready to carve through skin and bandages with utmost prejudice. Around him, having been pushed back by the wind, the creatures stared silently. There were five of them, and they seemed surprised as if they didn't expect him to wake up just then. Two were holding blowguns, a trio of darts was stored in their bandages to the left of their waist, and these darts exuded a dangerous presence to Long's spiritual perception. A presence that, surprisingly, his body matched. Poison, he thought breathlessly. At once, the memory of his last waking moment came flooding in. He had tried to keep everyone afloat when the ground gave way, but a dart had struck from the darkness, and he'd lost consciousness. He despised poison. It was the weapon of the vile Marsh sect, something that had reaped the lives of many seniors of his Blue Wind sect. At once, everything was obvious. These things had poisoned him and were now carrying him somewhere, thinking him dead. 
but they didn't know that Long's body had been tempered by the densest blue-veined ore of Lonely Mountain, nor did they know about the anti-poison pills that the Blue Wind sect fed its juniors. Even though he had almost died, his body had managed to fight off the poison. Locked in a spiritual stare-off with the creature surrounding him, which didn't seem bothered by the total darkness, Long's fury began to mount. In fact, only one thing kept it in check. These creatures with the washed-out yellow bandages that covered their body head to toe, with the sharp yellow fangs that poked out of their mouths, and with the devilish eyes that screamed death at him, well, they were a bit small. They reached just above his waist, making them look like bandaged toddlers. Bloodthirsty, armed, extremely dangerous toddlers. But while he felt distaste at fighting against such enemies, their small size didn't at all detract from their deadliness. They are enemies. He reined himself in, eyes narrowing even though they couldn't see. They must die, or I will. The mummies broke the impasse. As one, the two blowgun-wielding mummies moved their weapons to their mouths, while the other three stretched their hands out and charged. Longfang called on the wind. He found it heavy, late to respond, as if it had been slumbering for a long, long time. And yet, it replied to his call even if shakily. This wind was not used to moving. He jumped over a mummy, planting a palm on the top of its head to rotate over it. It reached for him with empty hands, which he wasn't a fool to touch, but its movements were rigid, amateurish. Going by their auras, these creatures had the strength of a late twin course practitioner, but apparently lacked the skills to utilize it properly. Two more mummies attacked him, sweeping and clawing at his chest. He dodged them easily, Besides their small size, these mummies also had the fighting skills of toddlers. Against Long, a master of martial arts, they were laughable at best. He weaved through their strikes as if he was taking a stroll, easily predicting the timing and trajectory of every attack. The darts were equally easy to dodge, because the mummy's posture and preparation made it obvious exactly when they'd shoot. When a master classes with amateurs, it is an eye-opening experience. Amateurs have the magnificent ability to go wrong where the master sees no wrong paths, to act in ways that the master would never even consider. Looking at your own starting point and seeing just how far you've come is a unique way to get perspective on yourself. Long appreciated the experience. His sword flashed once, and two mummies fell to the ground, cleanly cleaved in two. No blood came out of their wounds, only dust, the remains of things long rotten. It didn't smell, at least, which was a relief. The last unarmed mummy lunged at Long as the other two shot a dart each. The wind blew in a sphere, sending both darts off course before he ducked under the extended arms of the melee mummy. Before it could recover, Long's body twisted and his leg moved in a sharp arc, meeting the mummy at the side of its head with a crunch. The unfortunate monster crashed against the stone wall face first, falling limp at its base. The blowgun mummies were next, and a wind blade was immediately launched against each. The first was cleanly decapitated, while the second barely managed to escape by sacrificing its blowgun-wielding arm to redirect the wind blade. Long sighed as he shook his head. This wasn't a battle, but a massacre. The last mummy froze for a second, seeing its companions fall helplessly and its own arm lying on the ground. The cultivator raised a brow. What? he said. Want to fight? The mummy turned tail and ran, bandages flying in the wind behind it. A wind blade formed next to Long's head, ready to strike. Absent-mindedly, he noticed that its color was a brownish blue, quite unlike the cyan color that his wind usually sported. He let it loose, sending it flying against the helpless, unarmed, defeated enemy. And in a moment of hesitation, he let it dissipate before reaching its target. The mummy kept running away. Long blinked, surprised at himself, and then shook his head. What am I even doing? He didn't enjoy slaughtering fleeing enemies, but the mummies had tried to kill him. They were enemies beyond the shadow of a doubt, and letting this one escape would only come back to bite him later. When cutting a weed, one has to pull it from the roots. The reasoning had been ingrained deeply inside Long Feng's soul, stemming from the practices of his own cultivation world. Mercy beyond reason was foolishness, and it could only ever lead to disaster. This much was clear. He knew it. 
The seniors of the sect had spoken at lengths about this, over and over again. When they captured members of the vile Marsh sect, they always killed them. Always. Because the few times they didn't, they'd paid dearly. So why? Long frowned in thought. Just now, why did I hesitate? These mummies weren't even humans. They were monsters, like the ogres of Lonely Mountain, or the giant scorpions outside the Pira- Ah, it's Phil. The artificer's words still circled Long's thoughts. Outside the pyramid, he had asked to bury the enemies as well as the scorpions. It was a foolish, unreasonable notion, yet Long, in a moment of weakness, had agreed. Because how beautiful would it be if mercilessness wasn't the only way? How much brighter would the world be if enemies didn't have to be cruel to one another? If harm did not lead to more harm? If somebody showed respect instead of vengeance and broke the cycle of violence and hatred? Of course this would never work. It couldn't, and Long knew that well, for he had heard too many stories of disaster. The mummy turned a corner and disappeared, running out of view. Long sighed again. Because on the other hand, stories of disaster were just that. Stories. And in the world of cultivation, there were no absolute truths besides strength. The rules of the world said that mercy led to disaster, but who was Long to follow the rules? If it didn't work for others, that didn't mean it wouldn't work for him. Because Longfang would soar above and beyond everyone else, entering a new world of strength, where the rules would be his to dictate. Of course, for now, this was nothing but a distant dream. He should most certainly slay that mummy to escape future trouble. What if it called more mummies or even stronger enemies that Long couldn't defeat? But it was a weak, terrified, fleeing enemy and the thought of hunting that mummy down made Long feel so, so tired. He allowed himself this weakness. In the end, the reason Long let it go was the seed of doubt planted in his mind by Phil. If he didn't put it to the test, no matter how certain the result, then it would form a heart devil, a regret holding him back in the way of cultivation. Compared to that, the risk of letting the mummy go seemed to be worth it. Besides, if one does not indulge their inner self's desires, then how can they expect to be in tune with their inner self? And if one is too, then there is no cultivation to speak of. Long turned away, not pursuing the last mummy. This was a stupid decision, and he was certain he would regret it, but he had to try. Damn Phil, he smiled to himself. His weirdness is infectious. I wonder, am I going to become soft-hearted? Ah. Oh. Phil, what happened to everyone else? Are they alive? His eyes flashed dark. They'd better be, or that mummy and all its kin will regret living a moment longer, mercy or not. But all that said and done, Long was left in the middle of a stone passage, covered in murals of chore-doing little people and a black-eyed pharaoh above. He cupped his chin. Well, that's sweet and all, but what do I do now? He stared around, looking for a clue. Nothing. He shrugged. Guess I'll just start walking and see what happens. Clasping hands behind his back, Long put one foot in front of the other and started walking in the direction the mummies had been taking him. Besides a little weakness in the knees, the previous adrenaline had washed off most of the poison's effects, leaving him free to roam. Intersections crossed his path, but he kept going straight. When there was no straight path ahead, he turned left. As he walked, the layout remained unchanged, but the murals did not. The scenes of battles thinned until they disappeared. The little human figures lessened and their chores got simpler and more repetitive. From joy and pride, their expression turned to sadness, graveness. And above, the pharaoh's face became more and more wrinkled, his posture more and more hunched his awe-inspiring presence transforming into a worn husk of power. As Long walked, it was as if he was stepping forward in time. The pharaoh was dying, that much was clear. His halls were emptying, his servants decreasing. The battles of the past no longer reached him, the glorious monuments left to others. A heavy sadness permeated the air, and even Long found his steps softer, his breath more silent. He sighed and closed his eyes, paying respect to this long-dead, glorious monarch. Death always came. And life 
was the art of letting go. Soon, a new addition appeared in the paths, a door-shaped opening carved directly in the gray stone that made up the pyramid's interior. Long steps halted as he spotted it. He approached timidly, carefully. When he stood in front of the opening, his spiritual perception had already scanned the room beyond, a square space, save for a pedestal in its center. On it, a hunting horn stood on a velvet pillow, turned stony by time, but still maintaining its red color. The horn itself seemed to be made of white coral, as if it was a seashell that just happened to match the size and shape of a hunting horn. Water keys spread out of the horn in waves, splashing against the walls and making long spiritual perceptions see this room as flooded, though it really wasn't. Now this is what I'm talking about, he gave a toothy grin. Treasure! Not like the trinkets in the town outside. But he didn't step in, because right next to the pedestal was an intimidating axe-wielding warrior. It was just a statue, but the energies rolling off it spoke volumes of its danger. The statue's wild, barely-contained aura raised its own storm, tall waves competing against the horn's gentle ripples for dominion over the room. It was so strong, in fact, that Long was not completely certain he could defeat it. Treasures and guardians, this place looks more and more like a mystic realm. Ah, it smells like home. Will I ever go back, I wonder? Back to the blue insect? To my father and master? Certainly. With enough strength, everything is possible. My path is right. Long turned and walked away from the room. The treasure was enticing, certainly, but at the end of the day, it didn't suit his path. Fighting a powerful guardian for it, especially now, was probably a bad idea. Perhaps after he'd found the others, they could return. And besides, if there was one treasure, there were bound to be more. Long practically skipped down the dark, stifling paths of the maze, humming and dreaming of the power he could attain. More treasure rooms began to gradually appear. The treasures were great, but their guardians all had power in the Divine Ellipse realm. An earthly axe protected by a large coiled green snake, a drop of liquid fire protected by a red bird with its wings outstretched, and a crystal ball that shone with the colors of the rainbow. This last treasure especially attracted Long's attention due to its vast power, but the black-clothed swordsman protecting it gave him pause. Its aura was at the late Divine Ellipse realm, not something he could currently defeat. He walked away disgruntled. Not all treasures were born equal, but it seemed that the same went for their guardians. There were also several empty rooms, their guardians broken into pieces. Long guessed these were rooms that the expedition's masters had already conquered, or maybe that monkey man who'd fought him to a standstill. Of the class outside, Nobody else could deal with these master-level guardians. Long couldn't help wondering whether the strange calling he'd felt before came from these treasures. However, these all felt randomly placed, as if they were this place's less valuable secrets. Whatever could reach him through the pyramid walls had to be much more powerful. However, as he began to wonder whether he'd find something worth fighting for in this maze, Long froze in his tracks. From a room ahead, a presence called out to him, one that was both familiar and foreign. One that was powerful. He grinned, steps flying through the paths. He was not too careful anymore. After the previous mummies, he hadn't met any danger at all. This maze seemed very respectful of its invaders, actually. Those who wanted to risk their lives for treasures were welcome to do so, but those who didn't want to were free to roam in safety, watching power and riches slip away from between their fingers. Or rather, if this place really was like a mystic realm, it only respected the wishes of the strong. Anyone weaker than Long would encounter danger after danger until they perished, or, by luck or skill, didn't. Which was why it was imperative to find Phil and Mastic. Cat too, probably, Long chuckled, or Mastic will definitely not leave me alone. But at this stage, treasures were also important. Long wanted to help his companions, but it was they who had chosen to risk their lives coming here. They had to take care of themselves without relying on him, at least for a little. A gust of wind brought Long in front of the opening, and his eyes fell on a purple curved sword, its handle shining white. It felt right. And in front of it stood a large humanoid statue. Its head reached three meters into the air, while two clawed arms went down to its knees, and its waist was wider than a barrel. 
It wore thick fur, had thin eyes, and two tusks sticking upwards out of its lips, all culminating into an aura of frigid, bloodthirsty intimidation. Its claws looked sharp enough to cut iron. Long gulped. This was not a creature, but an avatar of slaughter. And its aura was at the late Divine Ellipse realm. Chapter 39 The Yeti Sword Long gulped at the sight of the sword's guardian. A bloodthirsty abomination, that's what it was. Made to maim and slaughter. It reminded Long of the legendary monsters of Whitecapped Ridge, the Yetis. But the sword next to it was a feast for the eyes in spiritual sense. A curved purple blade made for sheer speed, an edge sharp enough to seem fuzzy, even after so many years of resting in this dusty, dark tomb. A handle white as the purest snow, with narrow white veins running all the way from its base to the sword's tip. Moreover, the entire weapon radiated a sharp, electrifying aura, like it required an immense amount of effort to just keep still. It was a spiritual weapon, as elegant as it was intimidating, and Long's eyes were unable to part from it. It seemed built for him, his spiritual perception entering the sword and resonating with it, dancing in wild joy. Moreover, his current weapon was on the verge of breaking. Long really, really wanted this sword. But as his eyes flickered back to the Yeti, he paused. This creature was not something he could take on, at least not yet. It was still a statue, but he could tell it would attack him. If someone didn't have long spiritual perception, however, or at least some basic intelligence, they would only see a grotesque statue, and their body would be cleaved in two before they knew it. He gulped again. Temptation screamed at him to try, while Prudence shouted to back off. Shaking his head, Long's eyes left the sword and its guardian, scanning the rest of the room. The murals on the wall extended inside the room as well, but on closer inspection, they weren't the same as the ones outside. As one's gaze entered the room, the imagery changed into a tribe of yetis attacking and completely annihilating the Chordoing people, slaughtering them brutally and devouring their flesh. They were gray and large, while their tusked mouth was curved into a devilish smile. One yeti could even be seen using its teeth to tear a person's head from their body, resulting in a shower of blood that rained towards the lower images. But as one's gaze approached the back of the room, the small people seemed to be putting up resistance, forming large teams to wage war on the bloodthirsty yetis. At the very back of the room, a red-skinned, turbaned man could be seen wielding a purple sword to face off a yeti larger than the rest, with horns cascading its spine and a third eye on its forehead. However, as the rows of murals continued, the man didn't fight the larger yeti. Instead, he could be seen slaughtering other yetis, while the large yeti was always trying and failing to attack him from behind, its face warped into a mask of berserk fury. It was pretty clear what the man was doing. He was dodging the large yeti to slaughter its people, and he was fast enough to succeed. In the very last mural, the larger yeti stood surrounded by the corpses of its entire tribe, tearing its own body to pieces as it screamed at the heavens. By the side, the turbaned man raised his purple sword in triumph, lightning-shaped sparks flying around him. His weapon was the same purple sword that now stood in the center of the room, just waiting for Long to pick it up. It was a cruel story filled with despair for both sides. Long shook his head, paying his respects to both the turbaned man and the yeti leader. Both had faced the deaths of their people, and their final battle was one devoid of honor and morality, where only survival mattered. Was the red-skinned man right to use such despicable methods, or was he wrong? Even if Long felt an instinctive distaste towards his way of battle, it was hard to judge someone who shouldered the fate of many. But the pharaoh did not have red skin. Was this man one of his generals? Or was he simply a protector of the people? Oh, but this... This is history, realized Long, and his eyes flashed as he combined the pieces of the puzzle. This entire maze is the story of the pharaoh's empire, how he and his people rose and stood through the ages, and the treasure rooms all signify important events of that time. This is not just a tomb. It is history written in stone. Is this the reason for the pyramid's existence? Not just a resting place, 
but also one where the pharaoh's legacy can last through the eons, imprinted in stone that never erodes. A place where the worthy can acquire power by honoring the pharaoh's path, and where he can help his worthy descendants even from beyond the grave. Just like an almighty senior's final mystic realm. What a grand dream. And what a grand man. He must have lived one hell of a life. But come to think of it, his thoughts turned back to the problem at hand. In the mural, the turbaned man does not fight the Yeti leader. He avoids it, using superior speed to run around and slaughter the normal Yetis before the larger enemy kills itself in despair. If that man's sword is the reward, and if this Yeti is the obstacle, do I have to repeat that story? Is it possible that this room isn't about fighting? Is it possible that it's about... speed? Long's mouth formed into a grin. His gaze fell on the stone yeti. Is a statue supposed to challenge me in speed? His grin grew wider. This he could handle. Even if the yeti's power was one small realm ahead of him, speed was the one thing he took pride in. He could match an opponent like this. Probably. But the purple sword's allure was just too much. Gently, Long pulled his sword's sheath out of his robes. It had been strapped to his hip for so long that he'd grown attached to it. But in the end, life is the art of letting go. He slowly pulled the curved sword out of its sheath and stared at it. Its blade was nicked in places, telling of the many battles he'd been in, while a large crack ran down its middle where Monkadil's staff had crashed into it. Parting ways now was for the best. Breaking is a sword's disgrace. Long closed his eyes and touched the weapon to his forehead, letting a sigh and a whisper escape from his mouth. <sighs> so long, old friend. You lived valiantly, but you are now old. Sleep peacefully in the knowledge that I, the boy you nurtured into adulthood, will rise to break the heavens. In the dark, empty corridors of the maze, Long's low whisper echoed loudly and he willed the stale wind to carry it as far and wide as possible, a final courtesy to a loyal companion. Long slid the sword back in its sheath before placing it against the wall. He would carry it outside for a proper sword burial, but for now, he needed every iota of speed he could get. Carrying an extra sword would only slow him down, and it wasn't like he could use it to fight the Yeti in any case. If I don't come back, then let us die here together, old friend. With that, the cultivator slowly stood up, and as he did, his somber aura changed into a wild one. The wind softly hummed around him, compressed upon itself. When his eyes rose, they shone with a hard blue light. With his two hands, he grabbed the ends of his belt and pulled, tightening the blue robes around him, revealing a body chiseled in marble and muscles like taut strings. His gaze struck the statue as he flexed his arms and legs. His heart beat in his temples, the pressure of death shoving him downward. But a true cultivator does not fear the pressure. Instead, he revels in it. Long opened his soul, allowing the fear and hesitation to roam freely inside him. His body resonated with itself. He accepted everything about himself, his strengths and weaknesses, his greed and hesitation, his confidence and fear. For a moment, there was no distinction between his body, mind, and soul. It was all one, and it was all Longfang. He was at his peak, everything inside him moving in the same direction. And then he charged. His right foot slammed under the door's threshold, and the wind picked up, surrounding him as his body lightened to the weight of a particularly determined feather. The room was five by five meters large, with its ceiling extending to four meters high. The purple sword's pedestal stood in the center, with the yeti's hulking form right beside it. Long crossed the distance in a blink, reaching for the sword's handle. Could the statue possibly activate fast enough? Its eyes shone red. A large, four-clawed hand swiped at the air in front of Long's face, forcing him to pull his hand back and rotate in midair, missing the sword and landing with his feet against the room's back wall. The yeti was large with its three-meter-tall stature and long arms, it could almost reach from one wall to the other if it stretched. Its stony exterior was already flaking off, revealing gray fur underneath, resembling the yetis in the murals. 
Its narrow eyes were red like a demon's, and there was even the smell of rotten meat as it opened its tusked mouth. Its lips morphed into a hideous grin. It reached for long. The Yeti's aura was rolling like the tides and booming like a storm, but Long felt no fear, only burning determination. The stale air turned into a tornado of power, howling in the cultivator's ears and filling the entire room to the brim with air currents. From its pedestal, the purple sword hummed in joy. The Yeti's arm grabbed for Long, but he was no longer there. Like a ghost, his form flickered around the room, accelerating and decelerating unpredictably in rapid succession, guided by the strong winds that moved at his will. Unlike Longfang, the Yeti was buffeted by the winds, and it growled an annoyance. But it was not weak either. Its large arms blurred, hunting down Long's form with deadly precision. If a normal person stood outside the treasure room, and if there was any light, they would only see gray arms and a blue form darting around the room fast enough to dodge the eye, so quickly that it was impossible to tell whether there was one Longfang or multiple. But even as its hands crazily lunged around the room, the Yeti's form stood steady, shielding the pedestal with its body. Using his insights into the wind, Long could make his body as light as a feather before using strong gusts to rapidly alter his momentum. Even so, he was strained to the limit to avoid the Yeti's claws, and he had already suffered several shallow wounds across his body. A single straight hit would be the end of the line for him. He needed to somehow sneak past the Guardian, and he needed to do it fast. The Yeti showed no signs of tiring, but he could not afford to regulate his key expenditure. Slamming a foot against a Yeti's mural, the cultivator launched himself straight towards the Guardian. It did not expect that, and Long managed to twirl himself around its arm, bypassing its claws. They still raked across his back, cutting through his tempered body like tofu, but the wounds were shallow. He could handle them. A long reach means weakness in close quarters. Long ducked into the Yeti's guard and approached the sword, too fast for the wicked claws to retract. They didn't need to. The Guardian's massive head chomped down, fangs and tusks aiming to turn Longfang into a rough sieve. But the wind blew from below, and the Yeti only bit on empty air while a palm grabbed the top of its head and used it to somersault past. The Yeti rotated and clawed around it, but Long was not there. He was above it, body rotating horizontally in midair. And the purple sword was no longer on its pedestal. Chapter 40 The Sword's Yeti Time had stopped for Long Feng. As soon as he'd touched the purple sword, a presence had entered his soul, a shapeless form of purple, and his entire body felt electrified. His long hair all stood on end like a hedgehog as his grip reflexively tightened around the sword's hilt. The purple form looked at his soul, inspecting it. It felt foreign and violating, as if there was a stranger staring deep into Long's soul. For a moment, he was defenseless. Then everything clicked, and the sword's soul bowed to Long's. Purple lightning arced all around his body, diving and re-emerging out of him like dolphins in the sea. The wind howled and the lightning sizzled, forming a combination of sounds that made the Yeti look up. It let out a growl, and its claws reeked of death as they sliced upwards. Long Feng's mind was a mess. The sword screamed at him, begging to be used. The wind howled around him, waiting for commands. And deep inside him, in his lungs, a red power stirred. His twin cores shook, releasing a roar that encompassed his entire body. The red lightning trapped inside awoke as the sword's purple lightning probed it, and it was furious. The sword's lightning was infringing on its territory, and the heavenly lightning would not let that stand. It flooded Long's cores, lungs, and body, invading his meridians until they were full. Long's body was filled with power. He lost control of the wind, and the gusts dissipated around him, leaving him bare against the Yeti's claws. But the heavenly lightning was not done yet. With a mighty hiss, it snaked down Long's arms and dove into the purple sword, demanding subservience. The purple lightning roared back, and, like snakes, the two strands of lightning coiled around each other, 
fighting for supremacy. But the heavens never yield, and as Long watched, to his horror, the red lightning surrounded the purple lightning and smothered it, engulfed it. Just like that, the purple lightning was gone from inside the sword, and all that was left in Long's soul space was a purple sword, sharp and fast. However, it seemed that it hadn't lost its power. Only the foreign feeling had disappeared, as if the purple lightning wasn't the sword's real power, but rather something that its previous owner had instilled in it. Now, his connection to the sword did not feel violating, but rather intimate. Its presence was still strong, if a bit shaken. But at this moment, a final ripple shook Long's soul as the sword fully acknowledged him. Taligan. The single word rang inside Long's mind as if whispered to him. He replied, Very well, you shall be Taligan. But he was immediately pulled out of his trance because the red lightning that was still there demanded to be used. Long had no choice. As the Yeti's claws neared him, he poured everything he had into the attack and swung. The purple sword, Taligan, cleaved through the air like a razor, so sharp that there was no resistance at all. It was also extraordinarily fast, as if it moved on its own, and Long's hand was only following. In fact, that's exactly what was happening, and a weaker cultivator's wrist would have been broken by the sword's sheer speed. Long Feng could handle it, but controlling the sword was still something that would take practice. The downward swing reached the Yeti's upward strike instantaneously, clashing against the claws in a massive shockwave. The red lightning that was stranded inside the sword roared unleashing itself on the Guardian. It traveled down its claws and into its body, where it immediately began to wreak havoc. The red heavenly lightning suppresses, and the Yeti's eyes widened as it momentarily went numb, its skin smoking under the fur. From above, the sword clashed against the claws and pushed them back, throwing the Yeti's hand to the side and striking the top of its head. The Guardian's hard skin stopped the strike, but the remainder of the red lightning was still there. It crashed against the Yeti's head like a thunderbolt, eliciting a pained cry. At that moment, as the released red lightning was used up and the twin cores went silent, Long regained control of himself. Using what little key he had left, he dashed towards the door while the Yeti was still numb. A clawed hand reached out for him, but he escaped it, dashing through the opening and crashing hard into the opposite wall. He stood up immediately, ready to run again, but it seemed that the Yeti was unable to leave the room. Its claws were trying to push through the opening, to reach him and tear him apart, but it was as if an invisible wall was stopping it. Long let out a sigh. The Yeti had a new red burn mark running down the middle of its body. Unable to reach Long, it threw its head back and roared at the heavens, despair and lamentation evident in its cry. Long paused. Despair? The Yeti's red eyes were fixed on the sword as it screamed in helplessness, its animalistic voice a mixture of fury and loss. Long felt lost before his mind clicked. Is that what the Yeti leader felt when its people were slaughtered? Helpless. It was forced to watch everything trickle out from within its grasp, like trying to grab water. What a terrible fate. Is Taligan equally important to this Yeti? Is that why it was protecting it so fiercely? Is the story actually repeating itself? But I... The Yeti screamed again, seeming to go crazy. It hugged itself, and its long claws dug into its skin, drawing red blood. Long knew what would happen next. The Yeti would tear itself to pieces, suiciding in despair as the Yeti leader had once done. Imagining that despair made him sick. What had the Yeti done to deserve this? Even if it was cruel and bloodthirsty, it was just an animal, a beast. There was no evil there. It was simply the Yeti's nature. If anything, he was the one that stole something from it first. He was the devil here. It felt so bad, in fact, that he was considering giving the purple sword back, even if it felt like a weapon perfectly suited for him. Long couldn't tell whether the Yeti was a construct or a real creature, but the pain it felt still rattled him. He wasn't a soft-hearted man, 
but Phil's words once again came to mind. Even if the Yeti seemed like a monster, and maybe even was one, Long was willing to destroy its life just to get stronger? But a thought suddenly sparked in his brain. His previous weapon, the almost-cracked sword, still lay next to the room's entrance. It was too weak to keep following him, but perhaps there was a fate better than a sword burial. Swords don't need to be used, but they crave companionship. Quickly, Long grabbed the sword's sheath and raised it up, holding it in front of the Yeti. The creature was already dragging its claws over its body, drawing deep, painful gashes, but it momentarily stopped when it saw Long move. Its red, demonic eyes stared at him like a stray animal's, waiting. He approached, and the Yeti stayed still, holding its breath. Slowly, Long extended the sword's end through the opening, ready to instantly let go if the Yeti tried to pull him in. The creature watched him for a moment. Then, tenderly, it reached out. Its wicked, bloody claws closed around the sheath's end, and it pulled the weapon close, watching it as one would a baby. Its eyes met Long's, and in them he saw endless gratitude. In front of Long's shocked eyes, the bloody Yeti whimpered, pulling the sword closer and hugging it. It kneeled on the floor, burying its face in the ground, and tears could be seen wetting the stone below. The monstrous form sobbed and wept, crying for everything it had lost and now regained. Long could only stare. Unbelievable, he muttered. He felt incredibly satisfied. Watching the Yeti's relief, he smiled lightly. And as he did, he thought he heard a soft hum, one of gratitude and goodbye. He smiled at the cracked sword. Goodbye, old friend, he muttered. I think you found a companion better than I could ever be. He then turned around, leaving the Yeti and the sword alone with each other. Now then, he spoke happily marveling at the beauty and electrifying presence of the purple sword. Let's see what you can do, Talion. Guarding the sacred halls was an important yet harsh duty. Eon after eon, the pharaoh's servants trod the same paths, made the same patrols, all in absolute, stiff darkness. The concept of time had been the first to disappear. The outside world, with its sun and moon, was too far away. There was no day in here. The moments blended with one another, transforming time from a series of events into a continuous tape that turned on a loop. Enduring was... difficult. But despite that, the mummies were glad for their immortality because it allowed them to serve the Son of the Sun, their one true master, in perpetuity. Some of them still had memories of the outside world, where the sun and moon would rotate over the yellow fields, the blue rivers, and the endless sand dunes. They still remembered how it felt to see outside of this eternal darkness. That was back when they had just been created, before they donned bandages and willingly sealed themselves behind eternal doors. Only the occasional invaders broke the monotony, and their arrival was a guilty pleasure to the servants of the pharaoh. Like now, when two waves of invaders had appeared. And even if the first wave had escaped, the second was theirs to suppress. One of them had already fallen, and the rest would follow soon. The servants had been created to serve the pharaoh. They would not fail him. Such thoughts crossed the mummy's mind as it mechanically followed its companions through the sacred halls. It had no name. None of them did. Names were unnecessary because they were all created from the same mold, and they were all the same. Only their tribe had a name, as the eternal servants of the pharaoh. They were the mumpas. Something moved. The mummy's thoughts spasmed to attention. Its body rigidly pressed itself against the wall, hiding from the approaching invaders. Its four companions did the same, and those who wielded blowguns brought them to their dry lips. They hadn't tasted water in ages. Their cursed bandages waited at the ready, their yellow fangs and rusty talons bared. They waited silently, ready to ambush and defeat when the invaders rounded a turn and appeared in front of them. Only, these were no invaders. They were mummies, just like them, but something had happened to them. Their bandages were missing. Their gait was fluid instead of rigid due to the ages, 
and stone had replaced their copper bodies. Finally, they were small, much too small. It was as if they were new. Young. A long-forgotten word passed through the mummy's mind before it was immediately discarded. There were no young. They could not give birth. They were who they were. The five mummies got away from the walls and approached their injured companions, who jumped back in fright. The mummy paused. Had their minds been injured as well? It seemed possible. Poor servants. The injured ones seemed ready to run. But why would they run from their brethren? They were all the same. Injuries. The mummy took a step forward and communicated its thoughts, an ability that all golems had. Its bandages spread protectively over the newcomers. Where? The other golem paused, as if it wasn't expecting communication. You speak? It asked. Why not speak? We all servants. We only servant to master. The small golem shook its head, and the mummy replied quickly. We all servant to master. We all same. You injured. Of course they were all the same. All golems were the pharaoh's servants, while all humans were invaders. Simple. The two small golems seemed to hesitate for a moment before they nodded. So we all servants to master. Good. Time is running low. We must return. The mummy nodded back. At least they were finally coming to their senses. It had no idea what these small golems were talking about, but they were all the same, so it didn't matter. They had absolute trust. If we must, okay, we follow, it responded. And just like that, the mummies joined Phil Stone Golems on the trip back.